of, your, of the day, so um, I will make an exception to uh, our rules about uh, francophonie. Normally, we are supposed to speak French, but uh, I will. Um, I, I think I, I, I will be excused by uh, by my authorities to speak uh, to speak English today. I'm I'm very pleased to host you uh, today and uh, and tomorrow here in uh, in Paris and uh, online. Uh, we we are here in the premises of the French Ministry of Economy and Finance and, and Recovery. This is a place where uh, we try to um, to. Um, think and uh, conduct uh, economy policy making uh, in France. Um, I'm the Director General of the Treasury uh, uh, and, uh, and my uh, 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 administration is uh, trying to make an uh, economic uh, policy proposal and carry that uh, economic policy in the domestic, European and uh, international area. This includes uh, macroeconomic, uh, uh, response to uh, different crises. We had to deal with, uh, with the pandemic. Now we are dealing with uh, the, the war in uh, Ukraine. Uh, we, have, uh, we deal also with EU-related policies, uh, government spending, employment, social policies, regulation of the financial sector, trade, uh, and uh, official development assistance, uh, among uh, others. And for this purpose, uh, we need to pay a close attention uh, to uh, the work of uh, academia and academics and to sustain a dialogue uh, uh, with uh, universities, with uh, research centers, and with, uh, and with uh, academics. And for us, uh, it's very important to follow economic research. Uh, it helps us to uh, monitor the economy and to make our advisory uh, more pertinent. Uh, it brings uh, new perspectives and helps to shed light on emerging issues. It helps to build on the experience of other countries uh, uh, in terms of economic policy. And thirdly, it can challenge our views with uh, an independent viewpoint and evidence-based uh, conclusion. Uh, today's meeting and the Economic Policy Journal is the result of a long-standing collaboration between the Center for Economic Policy Research uh, uh, the Center for uh, Economic Studies of the University of Munich and Sciences Po Paris. Last year, CEPR decided to relocate uh, uh, its uh, headquarters from London to Paris, and we are, we, are, we are very proud that CEPR has decided to, to move to Paris, and I think it will uh, increase uh, uh, the collaboration uh, between uh, 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 economic policy makers and academia. We are trying to uh, have a strong link uh, between uh, 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 academics and uh, uh, the treasury. Uh, uh, I will uh, just mention a, a, few, a few examples. The first one is that we benefit uh, from uh, the knowledge, the insight uh, of uh, Agnès Benesikere, uh, who is not here today but will, be, will, be, will attend tomorrow uh, um, as the chief economist uh, uh, of the treasury. And for me, it was very uh, important uh, uh, as the head of the treasury, uh, to have someone from academia uh, 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 working with the treasury and uh, giving us uh, her insight uh, and, and, and the strong link and the strong track record she has in terms of uh, academic uh, uh, work. The second uh, example I wanted to give you is that uh, we have uh, uh, funded, uh, the Treasury has funded uh, uh, um, uh, uh, an innovation uh, lab in development, uh, which is chaired by Esther Duflo. Uh, and so we are funding uh, this uh, innovation uh, in development uh, uh, um, initiative uh, in order to finance new projects, uh, in order to uh, 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 um, um, uh, foster innovation in the area of, uh, of, uh, of development policies. So for us, uh, having this uh, link uh, between policymakers uh, and, uh, and academia and, uh, and think tank and researchers is, uh, is, is key and is, uh, is very important. And we also benefit uh, uh, from the very strong ecosystem uh, that we have in economics in Paris uh, and, and, and more broadly in France. Uh, with a different, with a number of institutions, I would name, I won't name them all, but uh, we have uh, PSE, uh, Paris School of Economics, we have Sciences Po, we have uh, Toulouse School of Economics, we have Polytechnique, etc. So I, I will not mention all of them, but uh, we we are we are privileged uh, to have a number of institutions 
uh, in France, uh, 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 and we can benefit from uh, from their from their work. Just a, a few words on your um, on the topics um, uh, that, you, that will be addressed today and their uh, relevance uh, for our work at uh, at the Direction Générale du Trésor. Uh, this is uh, obvious for the uh, macroeconomic impact of structural reforms. Uh, it's always hard when you are, uh, uh, you know, in the Treasury to explain to uh, our uh, ministers that you're doing to do these uh, structural reforms because you will not see the benefits. Uh, 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 most of the time, you will not see the benefits during your mandate. And uh, it's very hard to explain that we need to conduct structural reforms uh, that uh, uh, results will, be, will appear uh, maybe later and after the minister uh, uh, has left. Uh, and I think it's important to, 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 to have this work about the assessment of uh, the impact of such reforms and how these reforms deliver uh, in terms of producti productivity growth potential uh, uh, of, uh, of the economy. Um, Maybe it's less intuitive, but it's very important for us also, is uh, the issue of distributional impacts uh, of COVID restriction policies, uh, the role of uh, attitudes and discrimination in the labor markets, uh, or the effect of uh, uh, place-based policies, in particular, uh, as we call it in France, politique de la ville. Uh, in fact, we need to pay uh, uh, further attention to distributional effects of public policies uh, and to the behavioral dimension uh, of public policy when we carry out uh, economic analysis. Uh, and now we do so more and more, and I think it's important also uh, for uh, 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 people and the general public to, un to understand and to, and to own uh, the, the, the policies we are, we are carrying out. Um, uh, when it comes to the specific issue that you will uh, address this afternoon of school closures uh, during the COVID outbreaks, uh, um, France was a kind of a control group, uh, actually, as it was uh, one of the uh, uh, EU countries where schools uh, remained open the longest. Uh, we were uh, mindful of the risk of increasing educational inequalities uh, related to school closure, and the French government tried to, to minimize uh, this risk. We were uh, quite criticized for that and, uh, and, uh, and, and for taking the risk of keeping, uh, keeping schools open. But I think it was very important uh, uh, in order to avoid having long-lasting effect uh, on the curriculum uh, of, uh, of children. And the research by Nicolas uh, Fuchs-Schulden looks at longer-lasting effect, uh, and it is uh, definitely uh, interesting to understand effects on human capital uh, on the, on the, on the long, long run. And I want to thank uh, Nicolas for her participation. She's also a member of the French-German Council of Economic Experts and uh, of the Scientific Committee of the Franco-German Fiscal Policy Seminar, which took place in, uh, in November, also here in, uh, in, in Bercy. Uh, one uh, paper discussed today uh, relates to the particular contractual clauses used by Chinese uh, policy banks when carrying sovereign lending operations abroad. And in particular, it relates to China Exim Bank and China Development Bank. This is a very important issue. Uh, as China investment has risen, has, has risen considerably uh, over the past two decades, uh, and it is now uh, the first official bilateral creditor uh, in uh, many uh, countries. And this is very important for us as a treasury because, as you know, we hold the, uh, we, 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 as a treasury, we are chairman of the Paris Club, uh, which is the uh, official non-organization to deal with uh, the debt of uh, uh, low and uh, middle income countries. But it's true that we have been facing with the waves of cancellation of, uh, of, of sovereign debt uh, during the, 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 at the beginning of the, of, uh, of the 2000. Uh, uh, we, we, we've seen the share of the Paris Club reducing because we have cancelled a lot of debt in the HIPIC initiative. And we've seen the role of China uh, uh, rising. And so we've tried to think about how we could deal with uh, uh, issues of debt vulnerabilities, and we have created a common framework uh, with uh, the Paris Club and the G20 uh, to try to deal with uh, uh, current vulnerabilities uh, in, in debt and, uh, and, and deal with, uh, with debt treatment. We are uh, committed to make progress towards more sustainable financing uh, practices. As you know, 
the G20 adopted uh, operational guidelines for sustainable financing and conducted two voluntary exercises of uh, self-assessment. And France uh, uh, is participating in this uh, self-assessment and uh, um, uh, uh, we are um, publishing uh, our uh, lending data uh, 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 on a loan-by-loan -loan, uh, basis in order to, to, to increase transparency in the lending practices of, of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of countries. We also publish as a Paris Club an annual, um, uh, on an annual basis the total exposure of all borrowing uh, countries. Uh, and we are committed to publish uh, our portfolio of direct loans on a loan-by-loan -loan basis. Um, we have uh, um, engaged into uh, also a number of initiatives uh, with China. We have uh, taken a decision during the COVID uh, to suspend uh, uh, debt service uh, for uh, a number of low-income countries uh, uh, with, uh, I think, uh, more than 50 countries benefiting from debt service uh, uh, suspension initiative, the DSSI. Uh, and we are now, uh, uh, as I said, uh, um, uh, building a common framework with China in order to deal uh, with, uh, with um, uh, uh, debt uh, vulnerabilities uh, of low-income countries, trying to get all the creditors around the table, Paris Club, but also G20 countries like uh, China, India, uh, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's also an, uh, uh, an opportunity to encourage better practices uh, in, the, in the context of uh, debt uh, 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 restructuring and trying to foster coordination uh, between, uh, between creditors. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's something which is ongoing. Uh, it is challenging uh, because uh, we, we don't always have the same uh, uh, views and uh, we have to, 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 to work with some creditors who are not um, who have not the, the, the experience of cancelling or restructuring debt uh, uh, but we are trying to make progress uh, on, this, um, on this front and improve the practices of, uh, of creditor countries in line uh, with the G20 operational guidelines for sustainable financing. So for us, it's a very important paper uh, that was, uh, that was um, uh, published and that you will be working on this afternoon. Um, so with this, let me thank you for uh, attending uh, 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 this, um, this uh, conference and uh, uh, I wish you uh, uh, fruitful discussion on cutting edge policy topics uh, uh, for today, uh, for this afternoon, and for uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, Director General, for taking the time to come and, and, and speak to us. And um, it's very inspiring to hear you talk about all the ways that academia and policymakers are interacting in France right now. Yeah. Um, and that's, of course, what this panel is all about is policy relevant. Uh, research and thanks also very much on behalf of all of us for hosting us in these absolutely magnificent surroundings. It's our pleasure. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a lot to get through, so I'm going to just start. There are a few uh, business notes uh, to take care of first, so we're going to start our, our policy session. Uh, there are three sessions in this afternoon, and then there's, there's a special session uh, that follows. So the procedure for the for the regular panel uh, papers is that the author gets 25 minutes, just so that we all remember. 25 minutes. There are then two discussants, 15 minutes each, and then that leaves 15 minutes for general discussion. When you, um, uh, when you uh, want to make a comment during the general discussion, please uh, you know, flip your name tag up, but also actually please stick up your hand and, and tell, tell us what your name is, partly because I forgot my glasses at home in the hotel, so I won't be able to see who you are, certainly not your name. Uh, and also the, the recorders, the recording needs your name because they, they will want to note your name when they, uh, when they write up the, the discussions. Um, there are uh, a number of uh, new people uh, that we have to mention. Um, we have, I think, two new panelists now, uh, and I don't want to you know, have a huge fuss about this, but if you just wave your hand up here, here so we can all see who you are. So uh, there's uh, Emeric, I think is, is new, are you Emeric Henri, are you here? And, 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 and Andrea Tese is the second new person. Um, 
And then I was told that I should also mention the people who joined us in the autumn because they hadn't necessarily been introduced to everybody because everything was virtual and so on. So uh, we have uh, relatively new panelists, Sophia Barani, okay, Edward Schall, Edward Schall, uh, Gabriel Fack, Tiemo Fetzer, hiya Tiemo, uh, Emmerich I've already mentioned, Helios Herrera, um, Eric Hornung, uh, yeah. Hmm? Okay, good. <laughs> Virtual wave. Moritz Kuhn. Hi, uh, Christine Laudenbach. Uh, Claire Lim. Uh, Valeria Merlo. Uh, Paolo Pinotti. Federica Romei. Uh, Christopher Roth. Uh, Andrea, I've already mentioned, and Christoph Trebesch. Okay, so you're all very welcome. Uh, I should also mention Isabelle Mejean, who has joined us as a managing editor relatively recently. Uh, and finally, and you are allowed to applaud now for this last name, because um, Tommaso Monicelli is leaving us after many, many, many years as a managing editor. He's made an absolutely huge uh, contribution to this journal. So I don't, don't think I see him, but you can give him a virtual round of applause. Maybe he's on the Zoom. Uh, if, if not just for the, uh, the record. Is there anything else I have to say, Mary Lina? Have I just about covered it? Okay, great. So, okay, so it's five past, so we're starting 10 minutes late. That's fine. Uh, so our first paper uh, is gonna be given by Hans and Jos. So I think Hans is the person who's going to be presenting. So off to you, you have 25 minutes, starting from now. I hope so. Okay. I won't take it out of your time. Thanks very much. Thank you. <coughs> That's the one. Okay, well done. Off you go. Okay. Okay. So, well, um, thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have a kind of face-to-face -face, uh, conference workshop again. So that's, uh, that's very nice. So I'm Hans uh, from Vijnvestijds, also, also joining. So if you have any uh, questions, uh, well, you're here. So, um, well, we are talking about today about um, stigma effects and place-based policies. So, well, if you look around, you know, many cities, many places around the world, they implement um, place-based policies that try to improve neighborhoods, that try to improve people living in those neighborhoods. Um, and we can, I can mention many examples, right? But um, on many of those policies, um, they aim to encourage mixing of households, often explicitly by mixing different incomes, by different, different ethnicities, migrants and non-migrants, um, uh, education levels. And the idea is that these policies kind of assume that there will be spillovers. For example, we are in Paris, right? So I just looked at the French website and they write, um, it's only equality that we build this country. We cannot allow any neighborhood to be forgotten and abandoned within our republic. And then they invest five billion in, in, in worse neighborhoods and they expect kind of more investments to follow. And importantly, they also write more than just a housing rehabilitation policy. The goal of the urban policy is to create social links, right? So the idea is that this, these policies, they generate some, some spillovers for the uh, incumbent households, the, probably the poor households that live in, the, in those neighborhoods. Okay, place-based policies typically, if I look at least in the Netherlands, but also the UK Urban Renewal Fund, for example, um, they typically select and announce certain neighborhoods that are deprived and receive assistance. So at least the neighborhoods that, that will get the funding or will get the money, they are often publicly listed. 
And this may induce a um, stigma effect, okay? So, well, what's, what's neighborhood stigma? Well, we define it as the disutility from living um, in a place with a low status. It can be a street, can be a neighborhood, um, and people may dislike that. Of course, like we are, I think most of you are economists, right? So, and stigma is then a bit of a weird concept in a way that like with perfect information, this shouldn't, this shouldn't, there shouldn't be a stigma effect because people already know that a place is bad, right? So um, with perfect information, there shouldn't be any stigma effect. But, but what we see in practice, or what we, we see, uh, people don't have perfect information and there may actually be a stigma effect. So if you look, there, there have been many papers, right, that try to measure the benefits of urban renewal policies or some form of place-based policies, often by looking at house prices and they try to, if house prices locally increase, then this is an indication of uh, benefits of the policy. Um, however, some, some of those studies, they actually find negative effects, which is a bit puzzling, right? So you invest in a certain neighborhood and then prices go down, which is hard to explain. So we think that at least the presence of a stigma effect due to the announcement of, uh, of what neighborhoods get the money um, may be a reason for these negative effects. Okay, so we, we study a particular policy in the Netherlands, which is called the Act on Extraordinary, Extraordinary Measures for Urban Problems. Um, and from the, from the start, the act was very controversial because it was thought to in, induce uh, redlining. So what is redlining? Well, redlining is a discriminor, discriminatory uh, practice in which services are withheld from potential customers, well, the people that live in those neighborhoods. So why may this be redlining? Because the act prohibited unemployed people or non-employed people for, to move into public housing. Well, in many countries, public housing is not very important. You could argue, well, whatever, right? But in the Netherlands, one out of three housing units is public housing. And in the targeted neighborhoods, it is even 50%, right? So public housing really matters. And well, by essentially forbidding new uh, unemployed people to move in those neighborhoods, it, it meant that they, they were much more restricted in their housing choices. Okay, so the aim of this paper is kind of twofold. First, we identify the stigma effect um, in the housing market, which is, which is novel. Uh, and second, we aim to measure the redlining effect, the fact wh whether indeed we see a drop in the share of non-employed people in, in the targeted areas. Okay, so well, let's set a step back, right? Let, let's say we want to empirically identify these, these stigma effects, right? So what are the three um, ideal conditions that you need? Well, first of all, um, there, there must be an announcement, right? There must be a publicly announcement of the neighborhoods that will receive assistance. If there is no public announcement, then there is no additional information. Second, um, the government ideally should not introduce any other investment policy, because if you then look at the local benefits, or local costs of a, of a stigma, then you actually capture the benefits of uh, investment policy. And third, ideally, there is no household sorting in the sense that, well, essentially the neighborhoods you compare to each other are identical in terms of household uh, composition. Okay, I think the, the act enables us to kind of come close to these ideal conditions, right? So first of all, the targeted streets were publicly announced, right? So there was quite a bit of fuss about these, uh, these, this policy, right? Because it was controversial, so it was covered by, by the newspaper um, quite a bit about what, what streets and what neighborhoods were targeted. Second, there were no public investments. It was just kind of a legal change in regulations, right? It was not that it was accompanied by extra money. And third, well, there may have been household sorting, right? So we will pay specific attention because, well, the idea was to kind of ban you know, newcoming unemployed people, so that may have effects also on house prices. Okay, so we therefore first measure the effects uh, of the policy uh, on uh, the share of non-employed people, but also other demographic characteristics to see whether the policy induced any changes in the, in the de demographic makeup of the, uh, of the neighborhood, which was the goal of the policy in the first place. And then we use a boundary uh, discontinuity design to measure whether st um, stigma effects exist. And we focus on the discrete stigma effect in the sense that we, we compare the price change in the targeted neighborhood to uh, locations that are very close to it, but just were not treated and not announced. Okay, so preview of the results is that we find indeed some evidence that the share of non-employed people uh, dropped in the targeted neighborhood. And you can argue this, this is a mechanical effect, right? We, this is the whole idea of the policy. So indeed we find 
relatively sizable effects on the, the share of non-employed people in those targeted neighborhoods. Um, but otherwise, there is no effect, no robust effect on income, migrant status, uh, age, or whatever, right? So it, it, it just kind of changed a bit the share of non-employed people, but for the rest, it didn't improve social mixing or whatever. Um, and finally, we find a sizable drop in house prices of 3 to 5% within 100 meters of the, the borders of those treated areas. And well, we hope to convince you that this is the, mo the most likely explanation for this is, is a, the presence of a stigma. Okay, so a bit more on the, the context of the policy. So again, it's an act on extraordinary measures for uh, urban problems. Um, and the, the announcement was widely covered by the press, so many newspaper articles wrote about this. Um, and the main aim was to improve livability of distressed streets and increase social mixing. And it was a bit of seen as a last resort, so only for the worst neighborhoods. And well, uh, local governments had to submit proposals. And they had to put in quite a kind of bit of a, a long list of arguments why those areas should indeed be uh, um, uh, targeted. Um, so, well, the policy is, is kind of simple. It, it prevents unemployed newcomers from moving into public housing in those neighborhoods. And they, were, they could, of course, move into other neighborhoods, other public housing units, but they're typically quite long waiting lists, right? So it's not up to the newcomer to decide, okay, I can just live very close by. Usually it meant that they were ending up in a property in, in a very different neighborhood. And then, uh, well, as I said, the act is controversial because it may have induced redlining. Uh, people argued, uh, opponents argued that there was discrimination on basis of employment status. Okay, so this is a map which is a bit hard to see, but well, this is uh, for the people that know the Netherlands very much. This is, the, this is Rotterdam, which implemented the policy the first in 2005. Then after 10 years, other cities followed. You can also see that sometimes, um, sometimes there are like large neighborhoods, but often there are also very small streets that were uh, targeted, okay? Okay, so a bit, bit about the data we use. So we use um, uh, micro, micro register data, which is great, right? We have great data in the Netherlands um, uh, from Statistics Netherlands, and basically it covers the whole population between 2003 and 2019. Um, so we have the location at the property level for every person in the Netherlands. Of course, we focus on the neighborhoods and the cities that, were, uh, that received uh, this, the, the treatment. Um, so we have demographic characteristics, we have the employment status, we have income, age, migrant status, these kind of variables. We, we link this to uh, the building register data with information on all buildings and also the exact uh, location of those buildings so we can uh, kind of clearly delineate what streets and neighborhoods have been targeted. And finally, for the, for the stigma effect, and that's where we focus on house prices, then we use uh, house price data from MVM, which covers about 80% of transactions in the Netherlands, and we have a bunch of housing characteristics. And nice, the nice thing is that because we have lots of observations, we can do repeat sales, right? So we can actually uh, track the same property over time and see a couple of sales. Okay, so... Um, a bit more about the econometric framework. So we, we measure uh, redlining first here. Um, so the, the main question is, well, does the composition of targeted neighborhoods uh, change, right? Um, and of course, the effect of the treatment takes time, right? It's not that the stock of, of let's say, non-employed people changes overnight. It will take a couple of years before the stock will uh, kind of change, right? So that's what we um, do. So we have an A-dependent variable, which is uh, essentially, the, let's say, the, 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 the employment status of a person living uh, in property J in street S in year T, right? And we regress that on the, uh, the duration of treatment in street S. So it's more likely that this person will be employed after a couple of years of treatment. And then we have property fixed effects and municipality by year fixed effects. So we include a bunch of fixed effects to control for all kinds of unobservables. And um, the nice thing is that we can focus on very uh, close areas to the treated area. So basically what we do is we, we focus on the border of a treated area, look on both sides, um, and then we compare basically the, the change in, uh, in employment status. You also may argue that there are two effects, right? There is a sorting effect, which is kind of the aim of the policy, right? So um, existing people... Uh, so newcoming people are uh, not allowed to move into the properties. You can also say that there is a direct effect on the, the incumbent people. Maybe they, they may improve, right? Their income may go up or they may find better jobs because the people that move in are maybe better, right? 
So um, we also run uh, regressions with individual fixed effects to kind of kill the sorting effect, and we don't find any direct effect, right? So that it's not surprising, right? But we basically what we measure here is the sorting effect of the policy. Then the stigma effect is a very similar setup. So we have uh, low prices here of property J in street S and year T. And then we have here a dummy, which indicates basically whether the policy is announced in that year, uh, in that area. And then we have property fixed effects, which is kind of nice, right? Usually with house price uh, data, it's, it's not possible to do property fixed effects, but we can do it here. So what we do is here, we compare price changes of property that are very close to a treated border, right? One gets the treatment and one doesn't. Okay, so here uh, we can move to the results. Uh, we see here a table with the, the redlining uh, effects. Um, well, if you focus here on, on column one, you can see here a coefficient of minus 004. Well, typically the, the, the length of the duration of the policy was four years and then it could be, could be renewed. So if you multiply this effect by four, we have an effect of about 0.4 uh, percentage point per year. So after four years, the reduction appears to be about 12% of the mean, right? 12% 12, 12 of the mean of the non-employment uh, standards. So the effect is, is, is reasonably large, okay? So the policy has this kind of mechanical effect indeed of reducing the share of non-employed people. But you see also some effects on income and on the, this being the share of singles, but the effects are economically very small, and they also are not robust in the sense that if we focus even closer to the borders, 50, within 50 meters, the, uh, the effect goes away, right? So the only effect that is robust across all specifications is, is this one here, okay? So there is just this mechanical effect of the policy reducing the share of non-employed people. Okay, so this is just to show, kind of, to, 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 to show the, the, the validity of our uh, research approach. This is an event study for the um, share of non-employed people. Um, there was no pre-trend before, you know, up to 10 years before, and then we see a jump in, in the uh, uh, effect in the, uh, on, on the non-employed, and it slightly increases over, over the years. So it makes sense, right? It, it accumulates. Okay, so, well, apparently there is just a mechanical effect, it, just a small change in the share of non-employed, but that's it. Then we can move to the price regressions, right? And we run similar regressions. Um, and we find here sizable drops of three to six percent. So here we can include all, all observations. We find 2.6 percent. We add property fixed effects, 3.3 percent. Um, and then we kind of uh, make the distance to the border of treated areas smaller and smaller. And you see that the effects slightly increase, right? So within 50 meters, which is very small, of both um, uh, borders of both areas, we find that the a policy re uh, lead to a reduction of six, uh, six percent, right? So there is a sizable drop in house prices. Okay, you can argue there are three interpretations of this effect, right? So why, why do we find this negative price effect? Well, first is that the effect captures changes in neighborhood quality or composition. That was the first interpretation. The second is it's a kind of correct update of homeowners' information about the quality of different neighborhoods, right? It's not a stigma effect, but it's just a correct update of information. And finally, it is a stigma effect. Okay, so let's see the first, right? So let's, let's say you would argue that this is just capturing changes in the neighborhood composition. Well, first of all, what we do is we compare both uh, areas uh, before the policy and after. So this is, these are two cross-sectional regressions, right? So the identification is slightly less convincing because we cannot include property fixed effects. But still, I think it, it's highly suggestive in the sense that we don't find big changes in house prices, difference in house prices before the policy. So they, then it's unlikely that also the composition of the, na the neighborhoods will be very different. But after the policy, we find this a sizable uh, price differential. You see, you see again, standard errors are a bit big, so it's, it's hard to make very strong conclusions, but at least before the policy, those no local neighborhoods seems to be kind of identical. The second thing is that, well, you can argue that um, the, the, if anything, right, the policy has improved the neighborhood because the share of non-employed has, uh, has been reduced. So we expect an absence of a stigma effect that prices actually go up, right? So if anything, right, if we wouldn't control for any change in the neighborhood composition, we'd expect to find an underestimate of the stigma effect. Well, that's indeed what we kind of find, right? If we control for the 
local composition of the street, you know, the share of uh, non-employed, the share of migrants, share of, aid, uh, um, share of income, high incomes, these kind of things, we find slightly stronger effects for the stigma effect, but not much, right? They're not statistically significant, significantly different. So this, the first explanation cannot explain this negative effect. Then it's a second explanation could be that's a correct update, right, of homeowners information about the quality of different neighborhoods. Um, well, first of all, if you also look at the literature, people generally argue that neighborhood quality is not discrete over space. It's generally smooth over space, right? So you live close to an area and then you feel it's slightly less if you're a bit further. Um, and it's also a bit unlikely that homeowners are misinformed about designated neighborhoods, right? But are correctly informed about adjacent neighborhoods, which could then explain this discrete jump. But first of all, I think the continuity of neighborhood quality um, makes it very unlikely that this is a proper explanation. So I think, or we think at least, that this, this price drop most likely captures this, this, this kind of stigma effect. To be, it's important to know that we don't expect that we capture the full stigma effect, right? Like there's also a stigma effect maybe associated with living further away or well, living close, um, but not in the neighborhood, right? But so we only capture the discrete part here of the uh, stigma effect due to the announcement of deprived neighborhoods. Okay, so we do a bunch of robustness checks. Um, we don't, I don't have time to go um, in detail. So there is this big literature now evolving over about uh, difference in differences and the problems with difference in differences. So we do a couple of checks there to make sure that we address this issue with staggered treatment. Um, we drop a couple of neighborhoods that got treatment and then the treatment was retracted and was implemented again. Um, we include neighborhood by year fixed effects to further control for trends. We control for other programs that were um, implemented at the same time. Uh, we focus only Rotterdam, exclude Rotterdam, and also include the southern part of Rotterdam where some additional uh, policies were to uh, take place. We use an additional identification strategy using only time variation in the policy announcement. We use runner-up neighborhoods as a placebo uh, and as controls. So the results are very robust across these specifications. Okay, so finally, um, is that people could argue, well, maybe this is just, if this finding of a negative price drop is just kind of a pecu peculiarity of the act on extraordinary measures for urban problems, right? It's a bit of a peculiar, peculiar policy, you could argue. Um, so we also therefore looked at whether the stigma effects exist for other place-based programs in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, so we focus on two big programs. One is the National Programma Rotterdam Zuid, which is uh, focusing on the southern part of Rotterdam. And another program is the Krachtwijken program, the KW neighborhood. It was a big program. We evaluated it earlier in a restart paper, Jos and I. Um, um, and we find, found actually positive effects on, uh, on, uh, on neighborhood quality. So basically, we look at the same approach. We, we focus on price differentials very close to borders of treated areas. Um, so what do we find? Well, we find indeed negative price effects on the NPRZ program, right, of 2 to 6 percent within 100 meters. But, well, it's, it's a relatively focused program, uh, focused on Rotterdam South, and we have not a lot of observations. So statistical position is a bit of an issue, but still, right, it, 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 the negative sign is quite clear. And then also we look at the KW program and, and the same here, right? So and there was an um, announcement date, right? And it was clearly delineated when, it, when what neighborhoods were targeted and what also the ranking was of this, uh, of this uh, list that was um, published. So we find again here negative effects of the same order of magnitude as, as we find earlier, right? So these are two completely different place-based policies and we also find negative price effects here. So I think I'm almost there. Um, so. We've, we look in this paper at the Act on Extraordinary Measures for Urban Problems in the Netherlands, which kind of um, uh, banned uh, newcomers and uh, unemployed newcomers from moving into public housing. Um, well, we find sizable negative house price effects of announcing these deprived areas and streets. And we use uh, spatial, bo uh, spatial boundary discontinuity design and look at price changes very close to the borders of these areas. And we argue that this is evidence for a stigma effect. And um, so th the presence of this stigma effect, right, may, may address the puzzle why some studies on urban renewal policies actually found negative price effects while others find positive ones or some find zero. Well, you have to kind of address the issue that 
space-based policies may also uh, cause a, a stigma effect. Furthermore, we find that the policy-induced kind of redlining by um, because there was a sizable reduction in non-employed people entering in public housing in the targeted areas. Um, but it doesn't seem that the policy improved social mixing or whatever. So I, I think the, the, the conclusion you could take is that probably the policy was not a very good idea after all. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, and your timing was absolutely brilliant. So the first discussant is Mathieu Coutinier. Off you go. Yeah, 15 minutes. Thanks a lot for the invitation and uh, thanks uh, and for the for the paper and also for, for the pre presentation. It was uh, very interesting and uh, so I will uh, give uh, more insight about it. But uh, I learned a lot, so uh, thanks a lot. So let me just start with a very uh, short summary and overview of the different results and the, and the research question. Even if I guess that everyone has. Uh, in mind what was said by uh, by Hans. but so here the the main story is really about the evaluation of uh, this uh, local policy. Okay, and what is interesting here is that the local policy was really based and motivated by the aim of improving uh, the social uh, mixing. Okay, so I guess this is something that has to be uh, kept in mind and has uh, was shown by by Hans. What they do in the paper is to make use to a, a very uh, fancy boundary discontinuity design, and you have see all the list and uh, the different uh, robustness check. And just I want to say at this stage that it's uh, incredible work, and it's also it's I guess super uh, you know convincing in the way you implement it, and it's very super clear about the different potential shortcomings and how you uh, you address it. So I don't have much to say about about it, but much more about, uh, I guess, the conclusion of the, of the paper. OK, so there is two main uh, evidence. The first one, and you already mentioned it, is related to the reduction in the non-employment uh, households in the public housing. I guess this is important to say that this is within the public housing, which is what you said. That's something that is relatively mechanically. But then at the end, when you look at the different outcomes uh, you know, there is no changes or no significant changes, you know, in terms of incomes, in terms of the, I don't know, the characteristics of, of, the, of the population. But at the end, you have very striking evidence about variation in the price and reduction in the price, which is depending on the specification and the size of the, of, of the, of the treatment between 3 to 5%. Uh, and then, okay, there is three potential uh, explanations. It was uh, super clear both in the paper but also in the presentation. It could be coming from a change in the neighborhood. It can come from the updates on the owner uh, belief and information, and then there is a stigma effect. Okay, and then you already shown that m most of the results are pointing out to the to the to the stigma uh, effect. And then on top of that, and I will come back to it because I guess this is something that is uh, super important, especially for further uh, work, is related to two other programs. Okay, two other programs. The first one is based on the improvement of school performance, better access to the labor market uh, opportunities. So we may perceive this kind of of program as a kind of positive uh, program to enhance the quality and uh, the, the diversity of uh, this neighborhood. And this is uh, the same for the second program where I don't try to uh, name it. And then which is also linked to the improvement of the quality of the building of the, of the public uh, building. And then here you have also two, I guess, striking results is that you end up with the same uh, conclusion is that mainly the effect on prices, on the negative prices, is basically based on a stigma effect. Okay, so now, uh, just to, uh, to be honest, at the beginning I was super, uh, you know, I was relatively, uh, you know, uh, worried to say, okay, but it's hard to believe that, you know, this kind of policies may induce such an effect on prices, but also that the stigma effect is basically the only one uh, mechanism. So I tried <laughs> to find something uh, different, but to be honest, I didn't find something or other credible, uh, you know, uh, explanation. So all my suggestions or comments are based on how we can learn more about uh, this, uh, this mechanism, okay? 
So the first one, I guess, that you all right, uh, you highlighted, but I will come back to, uh, to it, is related to two main assumptions about the information of citizens and the owners uh, that are around about the, the different uh, streets. And then, I guess this is something that is, that is important because I thought at some point, okay, look, in my city of Lyon, I, I'm able to, to define what kind of uh, streets or neighborhoods uh, could be deprived and, and, and so on. Okay, so it was already difficult for me to, uh, you know, to make this, uh, this comparison and I guess there is something to understand and to push in that direction about the information uh, mechanism. Okay, so but just my first suggestion that is just related to uh, the empirical uh, strategy, as you said, the identifying variation is coming from two different aspects. The first one is about streets, okay, and the second one is about uh, some areas. So I just pick up from your, your paper uh, three maps. So here this is uh, for Rotterdam, I will have a look on, on Rotterdam where you have, I guess, two different uh, identifying variation. The first one is coming from streets, okay? So it means that there is some neighborhoods where there is only some streets that are targeted, okay? And then you look at, uh, you know, these, uh, these within 100 meters around the targeted areas. And then you have oh, some, uh, some larger neighborhoods, okay? And so my question is I'm wondering whether you may find some different effect because what I may expect is that, you know, as soon as you target a full neighborhood, okay, so basically I guess for people it's much easier to, to understand and to, uh, to localize where are these uh, places instead of just a uh, few streets, okay? And then I will also have to, uh, to have, so I'm interested because I can imagine that it's quite different for people, you know, if they are in the middle of these targeted areas and, you know, if the, all the different streets around are also targeted by the same program, okay, or if it's only just one street and then you are surrounding by other streets that are not targeted. So I will have some interest to see in terms of magnitude how it may affect the, the results, okay. So this is uh, the first uh, suggestion and first uh, comment. So the second one, I guess it would be interesting, not, I guess, for, for, for the paper, but, you know, having a discussion about this information me mechanism. So what you said is that you said, okay, there is some newspaper clip that mentioned at the time of the, of the policy, they advertise about the streets and so on. But when, when we look at your results, basically there is a kind of persistence of the effect. It's not just at the announcements, there is a drop in the price. So there is a persistence, but also, you know, price are going down years after years. So I guess it would be interesting to see how media or social media or the municipality has covered over the years the different uh, evolution of, uh, of this policy. And I guess from, you know, to, to better understand this stigma mechanism, it will be super important also to have the tone uh, also and how it was, uh, you know, treated and how was the media coverage and how it was uh, done and also, I don't know if there is uh, some debate also uh, in Rotterdam or in the different cities, uh, what was the different arguments related to this, uh, to, to this policy. My first suggestion is, yeah, this one is probably for sure uh, out of the scope of the paper for now. Uh, it's basically to have maybe, you know, again on this question about uh, information, having some uh, online experiments on this kind of, uh, of policy. So because here the question is really how citizens may perceive this kind of policy, how they may update, you know, uh, the belief and also the long lasting uh, effect. And I think that now with these new fancy tools of these online experiments where you can have very precise information on where people are located and so on, I guess it will be, it will represent a very fascinating, you know, complementary work to better understand <laughs> how we just build this stigma and how, you know, people at some point, uh, you know, may decide, you know, to, uh, to avoid this neighborhood and how it's, uh, you know, this policy has basically made a kind of new information that made, you know, this a drop uh, in the price. So I think that, of course, it's probably a, a different paper, but I think it will be also super useful from a pure policy perspective to have this kind of, uh, of information. And I guess it's related to uh, my last comments on, uh, as I said, you have two other uh, program, okay, that you mentioned in your, in your paper. And uh, as I said in the introduction, I guess these two programs are, to my point of view, something that is more, you know, a positive program in the sense that it's really to improve the neighborhood, okay? On the main programs that you mentioned in, in the paper, it's less clear, and I can imagine that in terms also, uh, you know, it's probably a much more open to debate on how to interpret this policy. But on these two first, and especially for, for the first one about schooling performance and also the access, you know, to uh, opportunities for young workers, I really perceive it as uh, a positive, uh, a positive policy uh, base. So now my question is how, so, and you find here again, a negative effect, and that is driven mainly, uh, even if it's 
yeah, the magnitude is, is lower, you still find the negative effect, and the interpretation is that this is also a stigma, a stigma story. So now my question is, how would it be possible to disentangle, even if this is, you know, a positive policy to some extent, is that because there is a media attention over a night borrowed, you know, on a given period, or is that the nature of the announcement, or it just because this is a just a policy intervention, okay? You may just see that, okay, whatever the nature of the policy, it's just a public policy, and then it is perceived, you know, it's perceived negatively by uh, uh, citizens. So I think it will be interesting, and this is my last um, suggestion, to think about what could be alternative other, you know, uh, positive news uh, about a neighborhood and in these different uh, neighborhoods, and to estimate whether, you know, which may help, you know, to disentangle with the media attention mechanism. So I don't know whether it's possible to find in newspapers or uh, for, uh, you know, some information about some famous people where if they come from, from this uh, neighborhood, uh, you know, deprived neighborhood, it could be, I don't know, sport players, actors, singers, but you know, to have this kind of positive, uh, positive shocks, okay? The second one, and uh, maybe I guess the literature already talk about it, but uh, about some local initiatives. So again, maybe I can imagine that there is some local initiatives to create this, uh, you know, uh, social network, social link between people. Maybe there is also some uh, media coverage of these uh, social uh, initiatives that may perceive by the local population as a, a positive uh, policy to some extent. And in the same direction, so there is this paper of Berendt and Scott in 2022 uh, 20, on the pioneer sectors, where they have some information, they're able to identify, I guess this is for New York, some uh, pioneer sectors and pioneer's uh, job. And then I guess it would be also interesting to find whether, you know, in the local newspaper, if there is some information and some positive news about the fact that in these deprived neighborhoods, there is this, uh, you know, um, pioneer sectors that decided to settle in this uh, neighborhood. And I guess it would be helpful, you know, to disentangle for this uh, media attention uh, mechanism. And the last one, it, I will try maybe to think about the same kind of framework, okay, but much more in some rich uh, places, okay? And whether here, as soon as you have some announcements in these rich places, or as soon as you have this media attention also in these rich places, whether it plays exactly the same role, the same magnitude to the one we find for neighborhood, uh, deprived neighborhood, okay? So, thanks again. I guess it was my only four uh, suggestion. Again, it was very fascinating paper. It's super well crafted, so it's super convincing from an econometric point of view. Okay, I guess identification is very clear, it's very transparent, okay? So now the question is, okay, so now I believe about the stigma story, but I want to know more about why what we find and what you find is really this question about uh, the stigma. Okay. So, thanks a lot. Thanks very much. <laughs> okay, so our next discussant is joining us, I hope, via Zoom. So is Monica there yes. somewhere? Hello. I don't know. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We can't see you yet, okay. but we can hear you. Okay. I can see myself, so... Uh, <laughs> That's always a start. Okay, I can. Good. Uh, uh, yeah, we no. can see you. Well done. Yeah, you can share, share. your screen then. Uh, share. Great. Uh, okay. Yep. Okay, great. So thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, comment on, on this paper. And I'm sorry I cannot be in person uh, in Paris, uh, unfortunately. Um, so I will start uh, also with a very, very brief summary of uh, just the main, uh, main findings uh, of the paper. Uh, we've all seen uh, a great presentation and also Mathieu already uh, summed it up, so I won't spend uh, much time uh, on this. So the paper analyzes uh, the Dutch Act uh, on Extraordinary Measures for Urban Problems. Uh, similarly to Mathieu, I won't venture myself into trying to pronounce uh, the Dutch name, so I will refer to this policy just uh, as ACT. Okay? And so the paper analyzes how this act affected uh, two, different, uh, two different outcomes. First, social mixing, so how does it affect uh, the composition of the population within the treated uh, neighborhoods uh, in terms of employed and uh, non-employed people, uh, income distribution, etc., and also how it affected uh, house prices. So for the social mixing, it finds only a limited mechanical effect in that it uh, led to a reduction of the share of uh, unemployed, of non-employed people living uh, in the treated neighborhoods. 
and then it led to a price fall about three to five percent, uh, suggesting a stigma effect. Uh, the paper furthermore uh, looks at two other Dutch uh, place based uh, programs uh, uh, in which it identifies uh, similar effects. So, I guess the main contribution of the paper is uh, the evidence of uh, these stigma effects in the housing markets, which are due to the announcement of uh, place based policies, which is a uh, novel uh, in the literature. So, in terms of comments, uh, first, let me start. I think also that it's a great paper. It uh, asks uh, a novel question and which it uh, addresses uh, thanks to a particularly suitable policy setup that allows for a cleaner identification and uh, amazing data. And uh, this uh, identified uh, stigma effect um, suggests an explanation for previously contradicting uh, findings uh, uh, found in the literature. So some papers uh, found uh, positive price effects uh, of, uh, of place-based policies, whereas uh, other um, papers found uh, negative or, or none. And uh, so accounting for this stigma effect uh, can explain uh, why these uh, findings uh, differ. So I greatly enjoyed uh, reading this paper and uh, I've, uh, I've learned a lot. So where I will start is I will give you something, uh, a few comments kind of directly uh, to the paper, maybe a few things that I would uh, that I was missing in the paper and then uh, kind of a more big picture uh, question at the end, which is not necessarily, uh, I guess, for, for this paper, but maybe for uh, for future research. Uh, so one thing that I missed a little bit in the paper was to know a little bit more about the background, about the policy setup. Uh, so uh, first, uh, I would have liked to know a little bit more about how the uh, application system or allocation system of public housing works uh, in uh, in Netherlands. So, uh, when uh, someone applies for applies for public housing, uh, do they apply uh, within a metropolitan area, within a city? Uh, can they choose the location? Uh, so. If, uh, say, certain neighborhoods uh, are targeted by this policy, which basically prevents unemployed people uh, to get housing uh, in uh, in these neighborhoods, uh, does it mean that they cannot choose these neighborhoods, or they just uh, they don't have uh, the choice uh, anyway when when they apply for housing? Uh, yeah, and then uh, this leads to a question that I was wondering when I was reading the paper: is well, what happens to those who are being discriminated against by this policy? Uh, so, uh, uh, what I understood uh, from the paper is that uh, public housing is very prevalent uh, in Netherlands. In certain cities, it accounts for 50% uh, uh, of the of the housing market. Uh, it is financially so it's, it's subsidized, so uh, it's uh, financially interesting for uh, for poor parts of the population. So, when there are unemployed people who uh, cannot apply uh, for uh, public housing because of this, uh, because of this policy, uh, what, what happens to them? Do they, will they end up uh, getting public housing in a different neighborhood? Um, the paper at some point cites uh, another paper that suggests that the only choice that uh, is left to them is to share then housing with, uh, with other um, uh, with other people, it would be, um, I think, useful to know a little bit more uh, about this. Uh, the other question I had was, uh, what about other uh, policies that were implemented uh, simultaneously? Uh, is there overlap with, for example, education policies? So when uh, when there is a, a deprived neighborhood and uh, the government is trying to uh, to help uh, this neighborhood. Uh, other policies might be implemented, like, uh, for example, putting more teachers uh, per uh, a certain number of students uh, in uh, in schools. So uh, educational policies uh, was there overlap with uh, with these policies. So this is not uh, uh, really mentioned in the paper. How I came to this question is when the paper goes on to analyze uh, the other two uh, policies, like the NPRZ uh, and uh, and then the, the third one. Uh, it mentioned that there was actually overlap in certain neighborhoods and for the analysis of the NPRZ, the paper uh, excludes the neighborhoods when there was an overlap. Uh, so is the same treatment applied for the main analysis? So when uh, the act is, uh, is being considered, do the authors also exclude neighborhoods which overlap with the other two, uh, two measures? And were there other policies that were implemented uh, and, uh, at the same time? 
uh, particularly thinking about educational policies, what is the overlap between, uh, for example, a school catchment area and the neighborhoods and how does, uh, how does that uh, kind of work out? Uh, regarding the mechanical social uh, mixing effect, uh, so the paper kind of uh, disappointingly uh, argues that uh, they identify uh, a mechanical social mixing effect in the in the sense that the share of non-employed people uh, drops down uh, in the targeted uh, in the treated uh, neighborhoods, uh, but then there is not not more. Uh, so I was wondering what was in, what was expected. Uh, from the policymakers when this measure uh, was impl uh, implemented, what was expected in terms of spillovers? Uh, could the paper maybe say uh, more on uh, what the expectations were? And then should one look uh, for more spillovers uh, of this uh, mechanical effect? For, for example, how does the uh, educational outcome in, in schools change following, uh, following things? Do, mm -hmm, students on average perform better in the treated uh, neighborhoods after after this i'm not saying this should be done for for this paper but it might be an interesting uh, an interesting area to uh, to look at uh some other question uh so the authors uh, mentioned at the beginning that there are three possible uh explanations for the effect uh, for the price effect that they find uh, one is that uh, there might be a change in uh, the quality of the infrastructure, which they can rule out because that was not involved uh, in, uh, in the policy that they consider. Uh, the other is uh, an information uh, interpretation in the, in the sense that uh, uh, their uh, uh, house owners may have uh, wrong information about, um, uh, about uh, their neighborhoods because there might be some information that's uh, that only the government knows about pollution or uh, or crime uh, and uh, then the third uh, possibility is the stigma effect i'm not entirely sure between the distinction of the information channel and the stigma channel uh, so uh, it might be helpful to clarify uh, a little bit that uh, and then the last uh, small comment that uh, i had was uh, the policy that's uh, under consideration. Uh, so there were two main criteria, two main uh, rules uh, in involved in the policy. One was that the policy uh, couldn't discriminate. It was only targeting newcomers, okay? so people who haven't lived for a long time in the neighborhood, and uh, it was preventing non-employed people to apply for public housing in the in the treated neighborhood. Now the paper mentions that there was a third. Uh, aspect of the policies that, that kicked in later, which was that the policy also prevented those with crime records to apply for public housing. And I was wondering whether um, the authors could get some more traction by uh, by exploiting this, this third aspect that kicked in only later. Uh, I know they don't have any data on crime records, but uh, presumably you know the timing of when this uh when this kicked in and uh so uh you might get some uh, some interesting story uh, out of that uh finally the big picture uh the big picture uh, question well i was wondering okay so the previous literature certain studies found that uh when there were place based policies trying to improve uh amenities uh in a neighborhood that that might have led to a positive price impact other studies find uh that uh there was no um, price impact or uh, or a negative one uh so the idea of this uh, of this paper is that uh, this may be accounted for by this uh, stigma effect now given this i was wondering well what kind of policy uh, should we have in order to have an overall positive impact? How much investment, for example, do we need to uh, have in improving the amenities such that taking into, into account the negative stigma effect, overall we have a positive welfare effect? Now, obviously, to be able to answer to that question, I guess we would need to also estimate what's the effect on the discriminate the individuals against which these measures uh, discriminate. And uh, also, uh, we would need to uh, have uh, to assess the broader consequences, the spillovers of, of these place-based policies. So this this is probably a very very difficult question uh, question to answer, but I think it would be very interesting uh, to move into that direction. So thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, so if people want to ask questions, could you tip your little name 
sides up. And if you don't, you can just raise your hands. Okay. Uh, I'll start with you, and then I'll just sort of go around. Get the picture. Is that right? Okay. And, and please tell us yes. who you are so that the... I'm, I'm David Newmark from you. uh, UC Irvine. Um, that's a lot of echo. So I, I guess I'm also... I, I, I share some of the... the the doubt you raised about this, the interpretation of stigma. I mean, at, at best I would say there's something unexplained here. I mean, stigma is, you know, the individual level we think about stigma as, you know, there's a, I mean, it could just be that you're, you know, assigned a label. Typically, we think about it as, as something others don't know about you, but when you get the label, people, you know, others find out, like some of the, you know, the hiring vouchers that sort of reduced employment puzzlingly. Um, but you had to sort of bring proof that you were eligible for a hiring, a hiring voucher, which might suggest you, you're conveying information. If you, if, I think, to, to Monica's point, if, if you could really f kind of identify, can, did, you know, was there information the government used in making this decision that wasn't publicly available? So like in the U.S., place-based policies are typically based on criteria that have to do with high, being high poverty or high unemployment census tract. Well, everybody, I mean, I don't know if everybody knows that, but if you, it, it, it's easily knowable, um, and I'm not sure the people who don't know it and know, you know, know that the policy took effect either. Now, you know, to Monica's point, if there's like, you know, hidden pollution and they told you about that, maybe that, 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 that's something different, although it's not clear why that would have an effect of the boundary. I guess I would say, uh, you know, coming at it from an economist, you know, I mean, what we're seeing here, I think, if I understood the results, is, is the housing price changes at the border, um, but the, um, the sort of employment, not, not, the, not the proportion on not employed, because that has to, has to change, but the, the sort of other effects on employment or income don't change discontinuously the boundary. So first of all, on, on that, which I think is the social mixing evidence, I don't know why that would change at the boundary, right? The fact that people across the street from me are more likely to be employed than they used to be, if there's any positive effects of that on me, um, there's no reason that ha that has a, a boundary effect per se. So I, I don't see why you, you, you test that at the boundary. But I would, when, I, you know, when I see evidence of housing price changes from these different studies, I kind of, the first thing I would think about as the explanation I would try to rule out, which I don't think was in your list, maybe you can rule it out, um, is demand and supply changes, right? I mean, this, this literally, at least in public housing, restricts demand from part of the market. Um, I don't quite understand how that plays out in the interaction between private and, private and public housing here, but if, if, you know, that's something that literally makes the place either, you know, well, in less demand from some, sub some subset of the population, and let's say that's a more diverse population and other people val value diversity. I mean, demand has literally changed at the border. Um, some of these other policies, uh, I don't remember the name of the, the South Rotterdam one, you know, policies that, 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 that aim to, to do a lot rather than this one, which really just aim to assign a label and keep people out as far as I can tell, um, not a very typical place-based policy, um, but policies that try to do something more positive may promise increased housing supply, um, right, through tax credits or who knows what. So I'm not saying that's always the explanation, but I, 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 would, I would add that to your list of the things you really want to rule out. Um, because the thing that really changes at the border is, is essentially the regulation or in other place-based policies, the tax credit or whatever else you're doing. Thank you. George, I see you have your sign up. George uh, Demenil, Ecole de Haute Études en Sciences Sociales. Um, uh, just two quick comments. I mean, it, it seems to me that uh, it's hard to talk about a stigma policy. It's just uh, everything else. Uh, it, it, this is um, an unexpected or unexplained uh, result on the effect of uh, on on housing prices. The other thing that that um, one has to, I suppose, keep in mind is that the people who are addressed by the policy are going into public housing, whereas uh, do I understand correctly that the prices that are being measured are the prices of private housing? Um, so uh, it, it's, it is uh, puzzling, um, and um, uh, I, I, uh, I think that the, uh, the authors and the commentators are, clearly demonstrate that there's an effect, but it, it's uh, very unclear as to what's behind it. Thank you. I have Moritz next. Is this the right one? Yes, thanks. Uh, Moritz Schulerich. Uh, thanks for the great paper. I have two comments, and one is one point that I 
quite, uh, that I just would like to have clarity on. But it's, the first comment is, the house price is an asset price, right? So it has a forward-looking component. Um, and a lot of the, other, I think the comments we had earlier from David go in that direction, like what has changed from a, like an asset pricing perspective when that policy comes into play. So one idea would be that people had expectations for house price developments in this region or in this neighborhood that got disappointed, maybe because there was some, gen some gentrification priced in and that gentrification now is not gonna happen because you, you preserve a diversified social base. Or it could also be that uh, you know people think this uh, this has implications for rents going forward, or this, I think this was also George's point, no? Uh, or it has implications for the risk premium, which you or the, the discount rate that you use to discount these rents. So, I guess my that connects to my second point, which is, could you can you look at what happens to rents in these areas? Because that would give us a very good idea whether that change is driven by um, sort of changes in fundamentals or by, I mean, uh, discount rate is also fundamental to some degree, or by a higher risk premium that people use to, to discount investments in these areas. Um, sort of, there's, I, I guess that asset pricing perspective could be helpful to actually understand what George called sort of this sort of black box effect um, uh, to, to tease out is this sort of, you know, is this the, is this the, the, the rent flow or is this the, the capitalization factor that changes? Um, the, the thing I just wanted to understand, is this a actual drop in the house price or is it just like less of an increase? So like the neighborhood increased by 10% and this region only by 7%. Is that what happened or is it actually a negative? It's a relative, okay, it could, could just be that house price increased less. So it could be of exactly that effect that people think this is gonna do like everything else. It's gonna gentrify like the rest of Rotterdam but then you put this public money in there so poor people, poor households can stay and then people revise their house price expectations going forward. Could be that. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, yourself. And tell us your name. Thank so, you. Yeah. I'm Nicola Limodio from Bocconi. Uh, I, I think there are two parts uh, uh, here. One is related to your, I mean, you stipulate a theory of stigma. And there are other implications that you have not explored. For example, and that relates to, to the previous argument. It shouldn't just be about prices. It should be about the number of posts that are out there. Uh, rents should be another indicator. Or the vacancy, tightness, how many empty flats. There is a second point about identification that I think came up in the discussions, but not so clearly. So you have a policy that affects certain areas, and you're comparing there is a control. But there are really two types of controls. One is going to be an area where there are no public housing, and so are completely unaffected. And that's going to be, and the second is going to be areas that have some public housing outside of your treated. Those are affected by the treatment because you have relocation from the treatment. So that's something that, uh, you know, you need to diversify because could uh, drive some of your results. And being a difference, you may be unable perhaps to see the opposite pushing non-unemployed out can, I mean, have some aggregate demand externalities that can, in these two, higher prices in this contaminated control. Thanks very much. I see a name tag up here. Hello, my name is Ginevra Marandola from the Italian Ministry of Econo Economy and Finance. Thank you for your paper. So I was um, thinking a little bit at the information uh, mechanism. And uh, as far as I understood, you find this drop at the borders. And the closer is the border, the larger is the difference. So I was wondering if the information effect goes in the opposite direction, in the sense that the neighbor, neighborhoods that are not affected by the policy are perceived as safe because they were not targeted and therefore this shows that they are better in a sense and you get uh, uh, higher prices in those neighborhoods because they receive this positive news that makes uh, the negative difference. Thanks very much. We have, I think, Giacomo who's online who wants to ask a question. Hello, hi. Sorry, I couldn't be there. Um, Super quick question. I think basically, you know, David basically mentioned this. Uh, and it's about, it's hard to believe in a spatial equilibrium model that you have effects at the thresholds, whether it's continuity 
In fact, you shouldn't look at the discontinuity because that's where the most spillover should be. Uh, it, it's, it's a weird design for this type of thing, I guess. But you know, on top of this, it's the only real thing that changes the discontinuity could also be the, just be demand. It's, it's only demand because you know, you're basically excluding some people from demanding housing in that place. Now, these extra demanders are actually people who are unemployed, so they're not really typically the people you think they're going to be demanding housing aside from like subsidies or stuff, stuff like that. But I found it a little bit difficult to, to really uh, think about this falling prices at the at, at the exact discontinuity like by the street because it's where this should not happen unless you have this discrete fall in demand and i'm you know this this place are certainly clustering type of people so that's why they were decided to be in the exceptional act but there is definitely something like that happening but it, it's it's sort of strange that the drop in demand is so large that's like a six percent fall in prices uh, or lower increase i mean you can never say that right? because uh, you know i can identify differences so I, I i find it sort of hard to believe that uh, that effect is happening right there is continuity because the only reason is actually something that changes discreetly there and you know demand seems to be i think a bit of a stretch yeah that's that thanks very much are there any other online participants who want to make comments or anybody else uh, if not, then do you want to just respond briefly? I don't feel obliged uh, at all to answer every question, but if there's one or two kind of highlights that you want to just pick out, then, then deal with those. Yeah, so great, comment, uh, great comments. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so I think things that, 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 that come here, and uh, like, uh, please realize that we have a very local identification, right? So any housing supply effects or something, they don't play a role because they're absorbed by the fixed effects, right? So. In, in a way, sure, like you can say this is kind of a uh, black box uh, explanation, right? But we, we kill at least a couple of uh, interpretations that I also hear somewhere here by focusing very on very areas very close to, to the border. So like for example, also differences in neighborhood quality, right, um, are kind of unlikely because we generally perceive these neighborhood benefits to be continuous over, over space, right? If you live very close to an, to an area, uh, to a nice area, still there are spillovers, right? And that's, that's also the reason why for the other policy, uh, I think Mathieu was commenting on this, um, w w there, there are positive effects to those policies, right? Especially for the KW neighborhoods, like we wrote a paper about this, and we find positive effects. But if you focus on very local, very locally on these, these borders, then you find a negative effect. And, and, and our interpretation of that is stigma, but we are also aware that, you know, like, okay, maybe we overlook something, but so far I didn't hear better explanations than that this could be stigma. So we, we, we try to write in a careful way, right? So if someone comes up with a better ID, I'm happy to incorporate it. But like, yeah, so we look at three different policies, right? And we find very similar effects. And I also hear like a couple of times, okay, is there, is it like is it like it's a big effect apparently? I'm I'm not sure, right? Like like the, like reputation effects are important in the housing market, but because like if you if you ask people like where do you live? I live in this neighborhood. Like you have immediately an idea on what you know, especially like in cities like London and Paris, it matters, right, to people, and and it can also matter locally. So I think three to five percent, I think I don't see it as a huge effect or something. Um, there was also a comment on like uh, forward-looking house prices. So we d prices are indeed forward-looking. Um, so we did a couple of event studies also in the which you put in the appendix, um, where we find actually that at the moment of announcement, so that's about one year before, you see this price drop, right? So at the moment, this new information becomes available, then you see the price drop, and prices adjust a bit afterwards. But that's the, the main drop. So it's already before the official policy starts, which isn't exactly intuitive. And I think that that is additional evidence that this is. This has something to do with the policy and not just to do with something else. Okay, there were a couple of other comments, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, like the interaction with other policy. Um, so it's good to realize that the borders, the borders do not interact generally, right? So with these, these other policies, so we don't have a big problem, but we, we did a couple of sensitivity checks where we exclude, um, uh, uh, exclude the, the targeted areas in other policies. Um, so yeah, it would be great to have a look at uh, rents, uh, vacancies, postings. Maybe maybe we, we look at time on the market. But like from a standard hedonic theory 
point of view, I don't see necessarily why vacancies would, would increase or decrease, because in principle, those effects should capitalize in, uh, in prices. Um, so I think your comment on like, okay, so it, it could be a stigma effect for the treated areas, or it could be a positive news for the untreated ones. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a fair point. I think in generally, it's a relative effect, right? So whether it's positive news for the one or negative news for the other, I think we cannot discriminate uh, between them. Okay, and final comment maybe like, okay, by looking at rents maybe, it would be interesting, but uh, the problem is that rents in the Netherlands are controlled. So they, they don't, yeah, most rents are controlled. Yeah, I think like uh, probably 60, 70% of them. So it, it's a question whether rents actually incorporate this information because no, they are controlled, so they cannot. They are not allowed even to uh, incorporate this information, potentially at least. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Well done. Okay, so our next speaker is Emanuela, uh, and you have 25 minutes from when the slides appear. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. I'm going to present this paper titled The Microeconomic Effects of Structural Reforms, an Empirical and Model-Based Approach, uh, which is co-authored with Sauro Mocetti and Alessandro Notarpietro, who also work at the research department at the Bank of Italy. Uh, and I have to, to say the statement. The views expressed here are those of the authors and should not be attributed to the Bank of Italy. So. Uh, our goal in this uh, study uh, is to assess the effects of three major structural reforms that occurred in Italy in the last decade uh, on markups uh, uh, and on total factor productivity through a more efficient allocation of resources on the one side. And on the other side, uh, we would like to evaluate the impact of these reforms also on GDP and other macroeconomic variables of interest. Uh, this is the outline of my presentation. I, I will introduce briefly and try to frame our paper in, within the literature. Then I will present our approach and our results and briefly conclude. Uh, so we look at structural reforms. These are uh, reforms that act on the supply side of an economy and they try to modify the very structure of the economy itself. Uh, by removing obstacles to, to efficient production and to help increase its growth. Uh, we uh, analyzed three major reforms uh, that were undertaken in our country in the last decade. These are liberalization measures uh, in the service sector, incentives uh, to innovation, and reforms aimed to increase the efficiency of our justice system. Uh, our analysis deliberately uh, uh, excludes other factors, ad both other reforms and other exogenous shock that uh, contemporaneously hit the Italian economy in the, time, in the considered time range. Uh, how uh, our paper relates to the present literature, uh, there are basically two main strands in the literature that uh, have, have the, has their objective the assessment uh, of the effects of structural reforms. Uh, the first strand uh, is given by reduced form evidence. Uh, these models uh, uh, provide strong, strong identification of the reforms, but they generally do not account for uh, general equilibrium effects and their empirical setting uh, does not allow to explore the transition uh, of the economy towards its new steady state after uh, the reform is implemented. Then there is a second strand in the literature uh, that is given by the DSG models. These are very rich and complex, mo and complex models accounting for dynamics, uh, for general equilibrium effects. But in general, uh, the size of the simulated reform is based on working assumptions. Uh, and without an underlying empirical estimate. So, for instance, uh, they suppose that 
uh, thanks to the reform, uh, a given country closes the gap with respect to the best performer and so on and so forth. Uh, our approach uh, is to study the short and medium long run effect of structural reforms and uh, we uh, examine, uh, we propose this approach that is in three steps. In the first step, we try to uh, find a synthetic indicator uh, which allows us to quantify the extent of the reform. In the second step, we provide microeconometrics micro uh, estimates uh, of uh, uh, the structural reforms uh, on variable of interest, uh, uh, such as uh, total factor productivity and firm smart gap. And in this step, we uh, generally rely on sectoral level or firm level data. And once we have an assessment of these effects, uh, we use them in step three uh, in the simulation of a dynamic structure of general equilibrium model to evaluate how uh, changes in, uh, in these variables that we call the, our channel variables and are very important in our model because they should be the same variables in the microeconometrics analysis and in the DSGE. Uh, how they influence uh, the macroeconomic variables of interest, uh, like GDP, consumption, and so on and so forth. Uh, so mm, this is a preview of our results. Uh, liberalization reforms reduce uh, markups uh, by 1.1 percentage points and increase the TFP by 3.5%. Uh, incentives to innovation boosted TFP by 1.4%, and justice reforms uh, also generated an increase in total factor productivity of 0.45%. Uh, the effect of the three reforms taken together on GDP after 10 years uh, uh, and accounting for the uncertainty that, can, that surrounds our estimates uh, is estimated between 2.5 and 6%, while the overall increase in potential output uh, uh, is between 3.5 and 8%. We have also some results uh, in, for employment. Uh, employment uh, uh, in the long run would increase by 0.5% and correspondently, unemployment rate would be reduced by about 0.4 percentage points. So uh, let's go to our uh, uh, macro, uh, macro level estimates. Uh, as we, uh, we have uh, regarding our liberalization reforms, uh, we consider uh, two major uh, reforms uh, uh, which occurred uh, right after the sovereign, the sovereign debt crisis in Italy, uh, the Save Italy and Grow Italy decrease uh, that uh, contain many liberalization measure, measures uh, in many uh, regulated sectors, uh, in retail services, uh, professional services, uh, in the energy sector and in transport sector. Uh, we rely on two main data sets, uh, the non-manufacturing regulation index uh, sourced from the OECD. This is an index uh, that is available for uh, all uh, regulated services uh, uh, it, uh, between 1998 and 2013. Uh, so it's available every five years. Uh, it ranges between zero and six, uh, where zero is, uh, indicates perfect competition and six, uh, maximum regulation. And we merge this data set with the structural analysis data set of OECD. So in this specific, uh, uh, in this, for this reform, we use structural level data for uh, 34 countries, five service subsectors, uh, and we have four time observations. Uh, this is uh, a picture that represents the evolution of our service regulation indicator for Italy uh, in the time range we consider. Uh, as you can see, uh, it follows a decreasing pattern uh, in, every, in all the five sectors, electricity and gas, telecom and post, transports, retail services, and professional services. And we will focus uh, uh, in the period uh, 2008, 2013, when computing the uh, reduction in the indexes itself to uh, quantify, uh, according to our step one, uh, the, re the liberalization reforms. Uh, these are our main equations. Uh, 
uh, for um, where me is the learner markup in uh, country I, sector J, at, and ERT, uh, and, TF, and the same is for uh, total factor productivity. RAG is the regulation indicator, uh, and uh, we have country, sector, and year fix effect also interacted between each other. <coughs> these are uh, some. These are our results. As you can see, there are uh, there is we, f we retrieve in uh, both with uh, interaction and with simple fixed effects uh, uh, a positive and significant relations between regulation and markup, and a negative one with total factor productivity. Uh, then uh, we retrieve we use our elasticities uh, beta hat. Uh, to estimate the variation in our, uh, uh, in, in our variables uh, given the, de the decrease in regulation that was experimented in Italy. Uh, and we find that the reforms imply a decrease in service sector markup, a reduction in monopoly rents of 1.1 percentage points, and the corresponding 3.5% boost in total factor productivity. And these numbers uh, are, going to are important and, uh, because they are going to be used as shocks uh, in the second step of our, uh, in the third step of our model, basically in the DSG part. This is all for the first reform. Uh, the second reform we, we are looking at uh, is given by a package uh, of industrial policy that went under the name Industry 4.0, was announced in 2014, and it, and it had uh, many fiscal incentives uh, for innovation. Basically, they were tax credits uh, uh, for R&D and uh, charges, uh, uh, increased in charges uh, uh, for the amortization of uh, uh, Industry 4.0 goods and new durable goods. Uh, what data do we, ref do we use to estimate this kind of reform? We rely on the Bank of Italy survey of industrial and service firms uh, uh, and that we merge with balance sheet data. Uh, in the survey that is conducted by the Bank of Italy every year, uh, and uh, uh, it, it generates a sample of 4,000 firms, uh, both in manufacturing and services, uh, uh, firms with, uh, with more than 20 employees. Uh, there are di two direct questions that we use. Uh, first, has your firm benefited uh, of the incentive, uh, yes or no? And then the second uh, helps us assess how fundamental uh, the incentive was for the firm in terms of investment. Uh, so this is our main uh, uh, equation. Uh, total factor of productivity of firm I at TRT uh, uh, is regressed on an indicator function that is equal to one in case the firm got the incentive and zero otherwise. And then the alpha terms captural, capture structural differences in TFP across firms and common shocks. So uh, the credibility of our empirical strategy uh, is, uh, is based on the assumption that without these incentives, uh, total factor productivity for the treated and controlled firms uh, uh, would have followed uh, parallel paths. Uh, to make our point stronger and to make our identification stronger, we, uh, we use, uh, uh, we use uh, the propensity score matching method uh, with difference in difference. Uh, our control variables are sector, uh, geographical area, firm size. Uh, also, we use TF, uh, TFP growth and lead, leads and lags uh, of TFP. And uh, from this from this graph, uh, you can see that empirically, uh, these firms uh, look very similar in terms of TFP in the two groups uh, before the, uh, the, before the uh, incentive starts. And then uh, those who got the incentive seems to have a boost on TFP. And our gamma hat uh, is estimated equal to 6%. Then we use the other indica indicator function uh, that accounts for the importance of the incentive uh, that is equal to uh, 23 percent, that is the share of firms considering the incentive fundamental to obtain our uh, overall increase in TFP that is 1.4 percent. Then we have the civil justice reform pact 
package. Um, we know that in Italy, uh, civil justice has long suffered from considerable dysfunctions. Uh, this, uh, these reforms started in 2011, and uh, they were, uh, many actions were taken, both on the demand side to reduce the number of legal disputes and on the supply side to improve productivity of the courts. Uh, our empirical uh, descriptives uh, um, re uh, in, are represented in, in this graph. In the first panel, we have the number of pending court cases. Uh, as you can see, since 2012, uh, the, the evolution uh, is decreasing, as well as, uh, as shown in the second panel, the length of civil uh, proceedings uh, is uh, strictly decreasing since 2015. Uh, and starts decreasing in 2012. Uh, there is, and this is uh, uh, a reduction of 15%. Uh, these effects were heterogeneous uh, across courts, also due to uh, the composition effects. What we do, uh, we uh, group, we cluster all the firms that refer to a certain court uh, and uh, we use balance sheet data for this firm to estimate the equation six, uh, so we regress the total factor of productivity of firms in court referring uh, to court C at in year T on the uh, length of uh, proceedings uh, and the raw terms capture structural difference uh, across areas and common shocks. And delta hat is exactly the elasticity, the parameters that we are looking at, uh, that uh, our estimates, uh, uh, the results are uh, 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 depicted in this table, uh, as you can see, there is a negative and significant relationship. So uh, we then multiply uh, our delta hat uh, by uh, the reduction in length, that is, uh, as, we, as we saw, 15% uh, reduction, and we obtain our 0.5% increase in TFP. So, uh, we can now go to our macro level estimates of the effects of our structural reforms, uh, keeping in mind uh, the results that we found in the previous part that, our, that are gonna be used as exogenous shocks in this part. So our aim is now to quantify the effect on GDP and other macro variables. Uh, we use um, our macro estimates as shock on markup and TFP uh, so for our method, this selection of the channel variables uh, uh, is fundamental because they should coincide between the two parts. Uh, it's a structural model that can capture short-run and long-run effect. Uh, and our, in our framework, uh, our structural reforms are credible and they have permanent effects. And we exclude all the other shocks. So this is just a summary of the estimates. Uh, our model is a new Keynesian multi-country model, two-sector dynamic general equilibrium model that is calibrated for Italy, uh, rest of the euro area, and rest of the world. Uh, there are nominal price rigidities. We have two sectors, uh, manufacturing and services, that use capital and labor and have uh, a production function with exogenous TFP. Markup is our indicator of market power in each sector. Uh, regarding labor market, that are, there are uh, search and matching friction, and so there are real rigidities. And we simulate estimated TFP and markup, markup shocks. Uh, so regarding the transmission mechanism, we, have, uh, we rely on two main equations. So this is the, uh, the first equation is the supply of each home non-tradable good N that depends uh, according to a CES function on uh, labor and capital. And uh, ZN is the constant elasticity of input substitution and TFP is exogenous and firms take it as given. Then we have uh, from the cost minimization of the dual of this equation, we can retrieve the marginal cost of the firm and uh, set the long run flexible pricing metric steady state condition uh, in terms of, of price setting. So we have that the relative price of the generic service 
uh, is uh, a, a gross mark is, give, is given by a gross mark upon real marginal cost. Where, our, where this theta n is the elasticity of substitution between different firms, between different services of different, ser of different firms. So it gives uh, uh, the, the higher theta, the higher competition. Uh, so we increase uh, sectoral degree of competition the, on the service sector. And uh, we increase the sectoral or sometimes aggregate, depending on the reform, TFP. And this generates two main macroeconomic effects. Uh, on the one side, uh, we, TF, the increase in TFP and the uh, uh, reduction in market power makes the factor of production more productive. So there is uh, an increase in permanent income and through a positive wealth effect, a uh, uh, permanent increase in aggregate demand. And then there is an increase also in aggregate supply and potential output. So here uh, we depict uh, the effects of our reforms for our uh, uh, macro main macro variables. Uh, the red rectangles indicate the effect of the reduction in markup. The dark blue rectangles, uh, uh, the effects of the increase in TFP in the service sector due to liberalization, the green one, uh, the, the raising TFP uh, that is generated by in, 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 in incentives. Uh, and the uh, last one, the light blue, uh, the effect of justice reform. As you can see, uh, these reforms uh, are expansionary for GDP since the beginning, and they are deflationary. And this uh, is also due to the fact that if we look also at the consumption panel, uh, given the timing that we attributed to the reforms, uh, consumers postpone uh, consumption to the time uh, when uh, services uh, that represent a high share uh, in the consumption bundle would be cheaper. So given that we, uh, we have uh, that the, ref the liberalization reform takes seven years to, uh, to be totally implemented, we have that uh, consumption gets a, a, a reduction in the first years due to intertemporal substitution. Uh, regarding investment, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the short run also there is a reduction in investment because firms uh, anticipate that uh, TFP uh, will increase due to the um, liberalization reforms and we, it will make uh, the both capital and labor more, pl more productive. So uh, they wait uh, for, in for investment uh, and then uh, it tips up after uh, four years. Import for that have a, a, a large share of uh, investment goods follow basically the same pattern as investment and uh, always uh, also uh, we have uh, the, a depreciation uh, of the exchange rate always due to the, uh, to the fact that uh, services becomes more, uh, m m becomes cheaper. So uh, in, in general, the balance of trade uh, is uh, positively affected. Regarding the, the effects on the labor market, we can study both the intensive and the extensive margin. Uh, regarding, uh, we have that as in every, uh, as usual in Keynesian models uh, with sticky prices, uh, um, there is uh, uh, the increase in TFP, given that there is excess of supply in the short run with respect to, and the aggregate demand doesn't adjust immediately, we have, uh, that is the, we, we register a reduction in hours uh, and a little increase uh, correspondingly on the Indian employment rate, uh, while, uh, in, uh, in the long run, uh, we have an increase uh, uh, in employment, so in the extensive margin uh, due to all the reforms, uh, that is 0.5% increase, and the corresponding uh, reduction uh, in the unemployment rate, that is uh, 0 0.5 percentage points. These are the results on potential output uh, that uh, considering uh, the uncertainty that surrounds our estimates, we, we have uh, that our reforms uh, uh, have an effect uh, of boosting potential output uh, uh, that, is between, that, is, that ranges between 3.5% and 8%, and in our central scenario, it's around 6%. 
So we also try to, given that, that our approach is novel, we also try to compare our estimates to what uh, other uh, uh, models and other uh, uh, PCC of literature find when studying similar reforms. And our systematic comparison is difficult because of differences in the methodologies, but in general, uh, our estimate seems to be in line with, the, um, with, other, uh, uh, with other pieces in the literature uh, studying similar reforms. So uh, concluding, um, we, we present, I presented a macro and microeconomic evidence uh, on the effects of three main structural reforms that occurred in Italy in the last decade. And uh, we, we do so by uh, using a novel approach uh, we first estimate uh, each, uh, the impact of each reform on uh, selected channel variables uh, at the microeconometric level on TFP and markups. Uh, and then we use the, our results as shock in the DSG model to simulate the macroeconomic effects uh, of the reform. Uh, overall, the effects of these reforms uh, that are, uh, as you uh, could see, are basically uh, M more uh, uh, expansionary in the long run uh, are uh, uh, an increase in potential output uh, between 3.5 and 8 percent and also have some effects on employment uh, that we would rise by around 0.5 percent with a correspondent reduction in, in the unemployment rate uh, by 0.4 percentage points. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Okay, your timing was spot on, so thanks very much for that also. Okay, so the, the first discussant is Moit Kuhn. You have 15 minutes. Okay, but, but I get some stats. Ah, wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much uh, for um, giving me the opportunity to um, present this paper. It was a great pleasure to read the paper because I think it addresses like a long-standing and very important um, question for economic policy making. So what are the macroeconomic consequences of, of structural reforms? And I think there's one message that we can definitely take from um, this paper, and maybe it's like more important than, uh, than ever, that uh, policymakers can change the world and can make it a better place if they um, do something. So um, what the author, authors do in this paper is to consider three, three structural reforms in, in Italy, and um, then, and I, that's something I, I very much liked about the paper. They combine empirical evidence with macroeconomic theory to derive um, results from these reforms for macroeconomic activity. And, and that's something I'm going to um, return to in the end of my discussion. Um, they also, and we just saw this um, at the end of the presentation, they also think about the transition path from the initial economy to the post-reform economy in the, in the years after the reforms have been implemented. Okay, um, I'm going to mainly talk about um, 
the empirical results because my understanding is that Federica is also going to talk about uh, the model a little bit more in the second discussion. Um, as, we, as we just saw, the, the authors consider three reforms, the product market liberalization reform, an incentive to innovation reform, or like if you want, it's just a taxation reform, and a civil justice reform. And they use two like, kinds of, of, of data to study these, these questions empirically. One is a European panel or a European country panel, and then within um, uh, data that only comes from Italy, a panel on firms and on, on court. And what they do is they then provide direct estimates of these reforms on TFP or in the case of the uh, product market liberalization reform on, um, on markups. Okay, and that's convenient because then they can take these estimates and can put them directly into the model. And I'm also going to comment on this later. Okay, so um, I'm more or less now going to talk about all of these reforms and have some comments on um, the way how it's estimated and um, the, the assumptions um, underlying the empirical, um, um, empirical implementation. And maybe some of these things are completely clear and it was just not clear to, to me and then I think it would be helpful in the, in the write-up of the paper to make these things a little bit more explicit that uh, also, also like readers like me get, get what, uh, what exactly you, you are doing and why you are doing these things. Um, so there's this product market liberalization um, scale that is provided by the OECD that ranges from zero to six. And now what um, we also just, just saw is that when they regress or when they, when they try to estimate the effect, they impose, li impose linearity. Meaning if you do a reform that brings you from zero to one or one that brings you from five to six, has always the same effect on, on markup. Might be true, might not be true, especially because these markups are highly non-linear. Non so they, they are between zero and infinity, and um, there is a discussion in the paper in footnote 12, so you're going to see, a, like, if you look at my discussion, it looks more like I only read the footnotes, but I found a lot of interesting things are actually in the, in the footnotes. So um, footnote 12 claims they also looked at non-linear specifications, um, but somehow, I don't know, I, I, I was not completely convinced of that there cannot be, that there's really the same going from zero to one um, and going to, from five to six. I think that should be from fully regulated to a little bit or if you do just a, the final, final step. So maybe there could be other nonlinear specifications that you could use or it's just because the support over which this indicator varies is like so um, narrow that this is just, uh, you're not going to pick up any of this uh, non-linearity that could potentially be there. Um, my second comment is about um, both the um, innovation um, reform and the civil justice reform. In the end, what you're running are regressions that look a little bit like this. So you, you have TFP as your outcome variable then you have some treatment, and then you have fixed effects. And um, so you have like, um, in, like unit fixed effects for um, courts or firms, and then also macroeconomic time effects. And now I was wondering, you are looking at the macroeconomic reform, okay? Like, why are you taking the average effect out? Okay, so shouldn't I, couldn't it be the case that like there's a huge macroeconomic effect but I don't see any heterogeneity across firms or courts, okay? In that case, because that's going to be your like, um, coefficient of interest, if there's no heterogeneity in the effect, you would say, oh, that's a completely unaffected reform, although there are large macroeconomic effects that you are just um, absorbing into, uh, in your, in your um, aggregate uh, time effect. So um, I, I was wondering how to think about this if you want to, evaluate the effect of a macroeconomic reform and then have these uh, time effects, how, how, you can, how can you be sure that not a lot of the, uh, the effect is actually absorbed in this, um, in this time effect here? Okay, um, and then about this um, innovation reform, um, again, I looked at the footnotes. Um, there, there's one 
claim about what you estimate is somehow consistent with uh, what the literature finds. I, I was a little bit puzzled by this statement because you have an indicator variable. So even if the reform would have been like twice as big or, twi uh, or half as big, you would still have gotten the same uh, coefficient because you only have an indicator. And uh, then I was not exactly clear how to relate this to, to other studies because somehow the, the size of the treatment should probably um, matter too for the, for the effect. Um, another point, and uh, you, you, you discussed this just with the propensity score matching, um, that's like, I, I, I completely uh, believe that there's a very, very sophisticated uh, machinery in the background. Um, I, I didn't completely understand how, it could, how you could deal with a situation where firms that expect a higher effect on their TFP are more likely to select into the treatment. So if firms that um, anticipate higher effects from um, investment, if they only take up the treatment, um, how, how your, um, how your um, approach to, um, to selection somehow can take, take care of this. And um, then you, you didn't dis discuss this. You only showed us the, the time series, I think, for the length of the proceedings. In, in the paper, you report this formula for the length of the proceedings. And I looked at it for a while and tried to understand why this is the length of the proceedings. And I have to admit, I couldn't come up with why this is the length of the proceedings. Like, I then tried to what I think could be a formula for the length of the proceedings. So uh, P are the pending cases. Um, then we have the resolution rates. So this is um, R. This is what you have here. So that's the flow of resolved cases. These are the pending cases. So the resolution rates is just the resolved cases over the pending cases. And then there are incoming cases. Again, this is a flow. This is a rate. Um, if I now do the law of motion, then I have the pending cases next period, which are all the pending cases from today, minus those that, those that have been resolved, plus the new incoming cases. If I now say the resolution rate or one over the resolution rate is the average length of, um, of the proceedings, then if I solve the equation, I come up with this expression, but not with this expression. Maybe you can clarify um, why, why you're using this or what the interpretation of this expression um, is. Okay, so that, was, that were my, um, my comments on the, on the um, empirical part, and um, the empirical part actually has a very positive um, answer, I think, because it says if the government does a, like a maybe quote unquote good structural reform, okay, then it can actually increase TFP. Okay, so um, what you estimate from the liberalization reform is an increase of 3.5% of TFP, the incentives to innovate 1.4, and the civil justice reform um, half a percentage. So this, but that's just a side remark. Uh, you seem to be feeding in 4.5%, at least in the draft that I had, uh, uh, but the estimates seem to be 3.5. So anyhow, um, I, I then, like, as a simple-minded macroeconomist, I just did counting, okay? So 3.5, 1.4, 0 0.5, uh, 5.4 increase in TFP. So now I think about my simple neoclassical growth model. I increase TFP by 5.4%. What should I expect? Well, output should go up by 5.4%. Okay. Now you have this like super sophisticated model, and uh, I, I felt a little bit overwhelmed why we have to study what happens after an increase in TFP um, in, in such a complicated model. Okay. Because what you seem to be finding is that in the year 2022, the increase an output is 5.5%, which I found really reassuring that I did the calculation here correctly that this is indeed 5.4%. So, but it, it left me kind of puzzled. Like, why, why do we need this very, very complicated model to, to think about what are the effects of an increase in TFP on uh, macroeconomic um, activity? So, one thing that, or well, now I'm, I'm offering some suggestions why that um, might, be, might be necessary or why such a complicated model that also has a lot of frictions um, might be an, 
good framework to think about the consequences of structural reforms that in the long run are going to increase um, PFP. Oops. So we, what, we, what we saw also in, in, in the presentation is short run and long run effects differ. Okay? And like, given that this is about economic policy and oftentimes policymakers cannot like, argue about, oh, that's something that's going to happen in 10 years, but have to also think about um, the short run because there might be elections and things like that. So uh, for them, it might be important to also think about what happens in the short run. Okay? And oftentimes, structural reforms, although you can do a steady state comparison and it looks all pretty good, okay, there might be an adjustment path towards a new steady state that might not like, immediately uh, yield um, the, the long run gains that the, that the reform is actually um, promising. So we see, for example, that unemployment is increasing, total hours um, decline initially, there are adjustment costs because of the frictions. So maybe um, that's something worth uh, discussing more that um, if I'm a policymaker and I want to implement those structural reforms, I have to take into account that the transition path towards the structure, structural reform is actually one that looks maybe um, at first glance um, not like a successful reform because I'm implementing this reform and I see unemployment rates going up, okay? And then maybe that's like not the ideal starting point for something um, where I actually promise everybody that the world is going to be better and we are all going to be richer. So, um, so still, like in the end, um, I, although I think that there is a case to be made about um, that these structural reforms and that we need this model and um, to, to think about the short run effects of these structural reforms on the macroeconomy, um, maybe you can explain a little bit better why we also have to look at the model for the long run effects because they, they, I couldn't come up with a good case why I should ever think that TFP increases are actually something that I actually have to write down a big complicated model because it's, all, it's just like we are going to get better in whatever we do by 5%. Why, like, how on earth could that make things worse or actually not yield uh, the 5% um, gain at least uh, approximately? Okay, so um, just to, to summarize, I think it's, it's a very interesting and, and relevant paper because I think it addresses one of the key economic policy questions um, that macroeconomists are facing, namely, what are the consequences of macroeconomic reforms? And, and like, I think what it's really nice is that the paper makes the point that structural reforms can be effective and that policy makers that think about um, structural reforms can actually um, lead uh, or yield um, some or can, can make uh, macroeconomic activity go, go up. Um, the empirical analysis um, provides important, um, provides evidence that these structural reforms are important and um, the contribution of the theory analysis, I think, could, could still be a little bit sharpened along the lines that I just uh, suggested. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Okay, so next up is Federica, who's joining us via Zoom, I believe. Uh, yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Sorry, you're like looking at something that you should know. Okay, can you see the, the slide? Can you see the slide? We can see you now, yeah. Okay, perfect. So first of all, thank you very much uh, for letting me uh, write this paper. I really enjoy it. I'm very sorry that I cannot be there. I mean, it's like for health reason, but I hope that to be there next time because I really enjoy Paris and it is a wonderful city and enjoy the panel. Okay, so first of all, uh, this paper is very interesting because ask a first order question, right? So what are the facts of structural reform in a country that really needs structural reforms like Italy, right? And on top of that, I'm Italian, so I also enjoy reading the paper because it's something that is very close to me, right? I really like the idea. Now, just to summarize, they have two pillars or three pillars. One is empirical, and what they do, they study from a microeconometric perspective what uh, the reforms uh, did with respect to the TFP. And what they found is that the reform seems to increase the TFP and decrease the markup. So something good. And then you have a, sec a second or third pillar, it depends how you define, that is model-based. 
So what they do, they uh, take this shock that are dropping markups and increasing the TFP, they put in a macro model, and what they found is that output increase, consumption increase, there is some unemployment at the beginning, but then everything goes very much uh, in the right direction after some years. So my discussion, uh, we decide, I spoke with Moritz <laughs> and uh, a bit. So I decided that uh, we decided that Moritz will, uh, will speak about the empirical part and, MP and speaking and focusing the most on the model side. So we have like some uh, specialization. So the first part that we start where Moritz finished, that there was some clarification about the model. Then I, I will show how the impulse response function to this shock um, compare with the data. And then uh, I will suggest uh, some alternative model, model analysis. Now, for the first part, uh, the model is uh, very complicated, right? I mean, it seemed to me that this is a big model that they have the central bank, right? Where you have uh, three countries. So I think there is Europe, rest of the world, uh, and Italy. And then there are two sectors, tradable and non-tradable. So tradable are manufacturing and non-tradable are services. Then there are such a matching friction in the labor market and later in the paper, they also introduce wage rigidity. So the first question is that, my impression is that what we're speaking about is this increase in the, in the TFP, right? And it's not clear to me why you need such a complicated model. Right? At the end to say, in 10 years, there's going to be this uh, a huge increase of six percentage points increase in the, in the output. So what do you need to have uh, this model? And also, what do you, do you need to have this model that speak very much about short-run uh, things? And even except for the unemployment, it doesn't seem that many variables behave in a weird way. Like consumption is increasing in a smooth way, output is increasing in a smooth way. So they are not in the model some perverse or strange effect. It's true that what Moritz said before. So maybe we are not going to see the increase in the output immediately because there is some adjustment that are taking place due to the price rigidity. However, it's not that from the model we learn something that is like crazily uh, strange. On top of that, uh, let's see how the model compare with the data. So what you see here, I plot the GDP. So these are the impulse response function of the model. And you can see that after the implementation of the reform, there is an increase in the GDP, right? And the increase goes around 5.5, as Moritz was pointing out. Now, on the right panel, you see that these are the data. So these are the blue line is the GDP in Italy. And uh, I, in order to compare with, uh, with the impulse response function, I divided GDP by the GDP of 2010, right? So at, you are at zero, zero in 2010. And the red line, these are like uh, the non-tradable output. So the, the output in the non-tradable sector. Now, as you can see, we didn't observe this huge increase in the output right, in Italy, especially for six years or so seven years after the crisis. But someone can argue, okay, but then at a certain point, maybe yeah, there were some crises, so there's some problem from the demand side, and then final year, we can find, uh, so in 2018, there is this increase in the GDP. However, if you look at the time series, so from 2000 to 2020, what we can see is that before there was a trend, so output was increasing and the GDP was increasing. And after 2010, there is a flat line. So this is not uh, the trend. This is the GDP in Italy. So after 2010, the GDP in Italy didn't move at all. And even if we divide in tradable and untradable, we see that nothing changed much, right? Oh yeah, but you can tell me, oh, Maybe it's not the GDP. Maybe this reform has some other effect on some other variables. So let's look at consumption, for example. So as you can see in the paper, what happened is that there are the reforms and then consumption is increasing. Here, what I plot is consumption. This is aggregate consumption. And the red line is non-tradable consumption. Now, let me say that non-tradable consumption does not correspond at 100% to non-tradable output in the other graph. And this is due to the fact that output are taken from one sources and consumption from another sources. So the classification is not exactly the same of non-tradable consumption, non-tradable output. But again, so you can see that after 2010, the line is pretty much flat. So there's not this huge increase in consumption in Italy, but even worse, when you look before the 2010, what you observe is that there was a sort of trend in consumption. And after 2010, the trend is very much different. So we 
if we just look at the reform, we implement this reform and then our consumption starts to decrease or the increasing consumption starts to drop, right? So the growth rate of consumption decreases quite a lot. Again, you can tell me, okay, maybe don't look at, but at consumption, let's look at exports. So again, here in the export, there is this increase and the import for some period, there is like a drop, but then they start to increase. Again, even if we look at this variable, so what we look at is like, okay, the uh, blue line is export and then the red line are import. Before 2010, you can argue that there was a trend. And after 2010, flat line again, right? So in some sense, uh, yeah, there is a big puzzle that is uh, the model predicts that we have an increase in TFP and a drop in markup. And this will cause a proportional increase in output and consumption and a proportional increase in the export, right? Something that we'd expect. If you look at the macro data after 2010, you can see that the growth rate of consumption, Italian consumption, outputs, import, export, drop. Right? So, I mean, what I found very difficult with respect to the model is that if you take the model and you bring to the macro data, right, then you would see that this increase in consumption, this increase in the output was not materializing the data. Now, I give two suggestions to the other. One is an easy one. So I think that the empirical evidence is pretty full and is a micro evidence, micro. So maybe like just drop the model, just like make a simple model and make a, a simple empiric empirical point. The second is a little bit more challenging. That is, we observe this increase in the TFP at the micro level. I believe you. I mean, I'm not a micro, an expert in microeconomy, e econometrics. So I don't know. It's like, I think I, I really believe to your strategy. I think it's pretty much very neat strategy. However, when we look at the macro uh, level, we didn't observe any of that. Actually, it's the opposite. After 2010, Italian GDP didn't grow of anything, right? So it was pretty much flat. And also the trend changed quite a lot, right? So maybe a second approach is that try to understand why what you observe at the micro level, you do not observe at the macro level. And yeah, I have two different approaches. One is like, let's call freshwater approach. You can perform a, what is called a wedge analysis. That is, write your model with all the wedges, right? So you write your model, the first of the condition, then you put the model, you bring the model to the data. And then you can see how much these wedges move, right? And this is like in the tradition of Charlie, Q, and McGrattan. So they have this seminar paper in 2004. And you can use their approach where they have a real business cycle model. Because at the end, yes, you care about cons consumption or price move, but I don't think it's the final point of your paper. Your paper is very much a paper of a, um, a positive shock on the supply side of the economy. And you want to see how this supply side shock is translated to the economy. And then you can see how the wedges behave after and before the reform. So maybe there are some wedges that move in a strange way after the reforms. And then you can put these to the reforms. Now, the main problem is that there are many things that happened during that period. So there was like debt crisis, the uh, central bank, the European central bank was at, was at the zero lower bound. There was the financial crisis two years before. So maybe, right, you're not capturing the, the reform. Maybe you're capturing something different. Now, the second approach is a more salt water approach so that maybe we did the right reforms, so we as Italian, at the wrong time. So Italian implemented this reform not in the regular times, not where we should, right? But there was this crisis, we didn't know what to do, and so let's, let's make some reforms just to show that we are doing our job properly in the moment of a crisis. So in 2010, there was a debt crisis, a very low demand, and the interest rates of the central bank were close to zero. So maybe to sustain the supply side, it was not the right thing. Let me do an example, like a parallel. Imagine that you have a house, right? And in your house, uh, you have two problems. First problem is that you have a leakage in the boiler. So you have a big hole in the boiler. And the second problem is that you have an insulation problem. That is a problem on the long run. And then some expert come to your house because you feel cold, you don't know what to do. And they say, okay, I fix the insulation problem, but not the short run problem. And it could be that in two, three years, when you fix all the insulation problem, the temperature will drop substantially due to the fact right, that you didn't fix the hole 
in the boiler that you used to have. So the boiler is not working anymore. So your temperature goes up for the insulation, but it goes very much down for the fact that your boiler is not working anymore. So this is, like, I think, like something that has been uh, um, suggested by Gaudi Eggerson, Andrea Ferrero, and I think it's Andrea Raffo in 2014, that maybe when a country were at the zero lower bound with very low demand, it was not the right moment to implement structural reform because an increase in the supply would lead to an amplification of the negative demand shock. So maybe like a second suggestion is that you can take their model and show under which condition an increase at the micro level of the TFP would not translate in an increase in the output, but actually in something that is the opposite to a drop in the output. So the conclusion, I think that you are addressing a fundamental question and the paper is very much appreciated, so you're doing a very good, good job. I think like, it's very puzzling what you find them at the micro level because it's exactly at odds with, with observation at the macro level. So my suggestion is either to, to modify the model and then to address a big question that is like, why we didn't observe this at the micro level? So what is if we have a positive micro level shock, why don't we have a positive macro level shock. Otherwise, I just make a, a simple model that make your point. OK, thank you. I will like to move, move myself. As well. Thanks very much. OK, are there questions? Are there questions on, online, first of all, since I can't see any online participants? That will give the people in the room time to. No, OK, uh, questions in the room, anyone? Yes, please. Yep. Everyone is uh, your name. Vincent Ster, QCL. Thank you. Um, yeah, very interesting. Um, I had two questions. One is, I guess, in these empirical regressions, you could also put some of the macro variables that you're interested in on the left-hand side, in particular in the first reform. I guess you could directly look at uh, GDP or, or employment or so. Uh, and then maybe a more uh, nerdy question in the model. Um, my understanding is you feed uh, markup in as an exogenous shock to preferences, but then in the new Keynesian model, markups are endogenous also because of price setting frictions. So I'm guessing there's sort of uh, an additional effect. I'm wondering if you're really capturing the, the, the change in markups that you find in the regression. I guess you would have to account for that effect as well. Thank you, please. Hi, I'm Inga Heiland. Uh, my name tag says that I'm based at the University of Oslo, but I actually just moved to Kiel. Uh, so much to that, but I have uh, one question on the, the paper, which generally I really enjoyed uh, listening to the presentation and reading as well. The question I have is whether uh, you also looked at other consequences of these reforms that might map into kind of important variables in, in the model. For example, one uh, variable I was thinking about was uh, related to the justice reform. So I would believe that one important effect of the reform was also to bring down uncertainty. Like it makes firms more likely to recover uh, profits from kind of any sales that they, that they plan to make, which could have an important impact on investment as well. And it kind of there's investment response in, in your model is a little bit puzzling in the short run. I mean, you have a good explanation for why it goes down if, if the only effect is on TFP. But I was wondering if it wouldn't be important to also kind of look at uh, other effects of these, these reforms. Thank you very much. Please. Um, yeah, um, my name is Claire Lim. Um, I'm at Queen Mary. I'm a, a microeconomic scholar uh, studying primarily uh, judicial systems and regulation as well. So my first question is about the judicial reform. So the primary variable seems to be about the length of the proceedings. In my view, the length of the proceedings is not usually a policy variable. It's a sort of outcome variable of something going on. So um, thinking of what kind of policies might have gone on at, at the sort of micro level, uh, we can think of things like increasing the number of judges to sort of uh, deal with the, wor uh, the workload of the judges, so that's one uh, one possibility. But you can also think about other things that may happen, such as increasing the cost, increasing the the, uh, the cost of the filing and processing, etc., which would typically have very different distributive implications um, that we uh, 
may not have looked at in this paper. So I want to know more about um, wh what are the actual like uh, specific policies that, that may have gone on behind this um, variation, changes in the length of the proceedings. So it could be something like structural changes in the entry to the lawyer's market. It could be something about the number of judges. It could be something about the barrier of entry in, in terms of the legal, like filing the lawsuits. So, and, and all those um, policies would have very di different distributive implications. Um, I also have the question about the liberalization. So there is very general notion that deregulation typically has a, uh, increases competition and, and breaks down um, sort of collusion, et cetera. But if you actually look at the sort of very micro side of the deregulation literature, there is very often a very perverse effect of deregulation. And one of the best known examples is the US uh, electricity regulation, which had very different, which had very heterogeneous effects. Uh, even across different states within the U.S., it had a very adverse effect, very um, sh negative shock in California, but it also had a, a pretty positive impact in the North uh, states as well. So I think that overall, more micro-founded discussion of, of, of the policy that actually went into these indices would be very helpful. Thanks very much. Uh, any other questions? I'm looking for hands. No, online neither. Going once, going twice. Okay, uh, Emanuela, uh, do you want to respond briefly to what you've heard? You don't have to address every single question, just the ones you think are most important. First of all, thank you very much for the interest that you show uh, towards our paper. Okay, uh, our first uh, question was about uh, the possibility of having non-linearities uh, in the estimation of the liberalization reform. This was also one concern uh, from one of our referees. And we uh, actually uh, investigated uh, a lot this point. And we also um, we, we, we analyzed uh, all the distribution of these uh, indicators. Uh, and we, we re-ran our regression in our robustness check for the first, third highly regulation, regulated countries uh, in, uh, in 1998. So uh, we constructed uh, a dummy variable that, that in, uh, an indicator function, function for, uh, for this specific group, and we mm, introduced it in our regression to see if our results were influenced by the fact that they uh, that they, their starting point was much higher than the other countries uh, uh, in the beginning uh, of the sample. And we really didn't find any, any differences. Uh, in, we didn't find uh, this big difference that uh, the discussion was concerned about between going from zero to one and to f from five to six. We also, uh, uh, we can uh, put it in better than in a footnote. We can add some robustness checks, but we really didn't find these this non-linearities. Um, then, okay, uh, I think uh, apart from the main, uh, from the many concerns uh, regarding the the, um, the micro model, uh, I think the main points uh, that emerged in this discussion were uh, uh, in, the, in the link that we make between the two parts. Okay, uh, regarding the average effect that we cut out uh, by introducing the trend trend in our uh, micro, micro uh, level regression, uh, we do so because we really want to uh, to um, reach uh, to 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 reach at, uh, as as much causality as possible in our micro, micro level estimates. Okay, we understand that it's not these these estimates are uh, probably not perfect on the causality point of view, but we really uh, try our best to clean it as much as possible. Also because of another reason, because. Uh, what probably I didn't put, I didn't state clearly in the presentation, and uh, I apologize about it, is that we do not look at we do not uh, look at the uh, at these reforms thinking that the this six percent that we find uh, is uh, uh, could be retrieved in the actual GDP data in Italy. I mean, this is comp this is not our uh, our scope. We really uh, isolate these reforms. Uh, 
and I, th I thought I said, we abstract from many other shocks that hit the Italian economy in that period. We really don't want this. Uh, I mean, I, I really apologize if this confusion emerged. We, did, we really don't think that, we know that Italy didn't grow at 5%, right? So, I mean, <laughs> it would be quite naive uh, on our side. We just would, wanted to uh, analyze uh, uh, in, in independent terms uh, what is the effect of this kind of reforms. And basically, the comment would be, can you imagine without? I mean, it's not that we think these reforms, they were completely translated in a GDP growth. It's just a, like, a, think about it as a partial derivative. We just isolate the reforms. Uh, uh, we use the micro model also to clean it as much as possible from other uh, uh, shocks and effects. Uh, we want to abstract from all other shocks that, uh, that affect the country. And I, I, I want to, to be clear on this point. We, that is not our purpose. We, we cannot match what we find in our graphs, uh, consumption, GDP, and so on and so forth, with what really happened in the, series, in the time series uh, in the in Italy in the same period. Of course, these are just three, three small, re I mean, they were not so small, but they were just three structural reforms that happened in that period. But in the country, in that period, many other things happened. There were other reforms that we didn't have data to estimate, because as, you, as, I, as I said, there are two conditions that we need to estimate, to, to try to give account of these reforms first, uh, to quantify them. Uh, and then, secondly, uh, to try uh, to uh, analyze them both on the microeconomic and macroeconomic level. Macroeconomic, for micro uh, analysis, you need micro data, so it's not that all uh, reforms are easily transposed into firm level or structural level data. Uh, so this is really out of the scope of the paper to reproduce the, the dynamics of macro variables, GDP consumption in Italy, just looking at these reforms. I mean, it's really, they, the, the paper should really be taught in a very different way. I mean, can you imagine if we didn't even implement these reforms, uh, how the dynamics of these variables could have been? I mean, and this is something I really care about because otherwise uh, we are really not in the spirit of our study. Uh, regarding uh, the, the propensity, uh, the, pen, the relationship, the index between the pending cases and the length of justice, uh, I think you missed that 30, 30, uh, 365 times. I mean, you have to multiply by the number of the days in a year. And if you add that coefficient, I mean, uh, hopefully everything m should make sense. Uh, and, it's, and anyway, that's a formula that is very used in law and economics. I mean, something that we got from, that we, uh, that is uh, in the literature is not something that we constructed by our own. Uh, regarding, uh, uh, TFP, I mean, um, the point is, uh, we, pr we, we do two things in this paper. First, we want to um, analyze these reforms and their effects. Second, we try to do so by following a different approach. Uh, it's not, we are not thinking that our approach is better or worse than those that are already in the literature and are uh, for sure uh, great approaches and I, many contribu great contributions in the literature that follow different approaches. It's, mm, it's a proposal of bridging these two literatures. Uh, we use these variables, uh, TFP and markups, uh, because of, also because of the reforms that we consider, that we put under our, con un under our lenses. Uh, you could consider other things. For instance, uh, you, we could have considered the Jobs Act. In that case, we would have shocked uh, the wedge variable uh, of the, the, in the equation that links uh, wa real wages uh, and labor productivity, for instance. I mean, this is just uh, a proposal, uh, this is just um, a, a, an attempt to, uh, to link these two literatures uh, and to provide a different, uh, uh, and a different uh, approach to evaluate structural reforms. Then, obviously, as every approach has its limits, and 
maybe, hopefully, also its bright sides. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much. <laughs> okay, so looking at the time, I think uh, we have break now, and I think we can probably just reconvene when we were originally supposed to, which was 15.35. Okay, so our next speaker is going to be joining us via Zoom. Um, so do we have Christoph on the Zoom? Hi. Hi. <laughs> we can hear you, but we can't see you, but we will soon. I'll let you know when, I'll let you know when we can see you. Okay, we can see you, great. Uh, off, uh, so you can share your slides. We're ready to start whenever you are. Okay, great. Uh, let me... Share my screen. All right, can everybody see this? Yeah, maybe just a little bit more volume, maybe? For Christoph? Okay. Is it just me? Does it work like this? That's perfect, thank you. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, so uh, hi everybody. Uh, I'm sorry I, I can't be there. Um, uh, I, I got corona four days ago, uh, so uh, uh, that was supposed to be my my first foreign trip in the pandemic and now the pandemic hit me. Anyway, bad luck. Uh, I, I, I was looking forward to to the dinner and seeing colleagues, but anyway, uh, that's how it is. So uh, if I'm, uh, uh, if 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 the kids run in here, you know, we're 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 in uh, uh, um, uh, Corona mode here. So please please forgive if that if that happens. So nevertheless, thanks a lot. I'm very happy to to be able to present this project, um, which is uh, joint uh, with. Uh, Four co-authors. It's actually an interdisciplinary project, uh, joined with Anna Galpern, uh, Sebastian Horn, Scott Morris, and Bradley Park. So these are uh, legal scholars, political scientists, and economists. And it's a paper on um, uh, how China lends. Right. So the, the key motivation of this paper is really that China has become a major predator to the developing world. Right. It's it's become the largest official creditor, um, particularly via its state-owned banks, so Exim Bank and the China Development Bank, uh, the portfolio of, 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 of these banks, of these Chinese banks, uh, are now larger than the entire portfolio of the World Bank, or the entire portfolio of the IMF, or the entire portfolio of all OECD uh, um, uh, go creditor governments taken together. So think of the Paris Club, if, if that is, if that is um, as, uh, something you're aware of. Um, so in other words, China has really become this major global creditor to the global south. Uh, but at the same time, we know very little about this creditor, right? So we lack basic facts about its lending. Why do we lack these facts? Be because China is basically not releasing any granular uh, information on its lending, on where it lends, on uh, what terms it lends at. And it's not part of the usual organizations that require data sharing. So it's not part of the OECD. It's not part of the Paris Club. Um, it is not uh, under the radar screen on the radar screen of credit rating credit rating agencies right, that meticulously follow a bond lending and defaults on on bonds. Uh, when it comes to China, basically we we have this this major knowledge gap. We, we, it, it's not. This, neither the lending is meticulously tracked uh, by international organization, nor the defaults, uh, nor the terms of this lending, right? So, so this is a major challenge for us as, as, as international finance scholars, for people focusing on sovereign debt in, in the international arena, 
Uh, we have this big new creditor, but we know so little about it. Okay. Um, so sight unseen, uh, these can you get out? Yeah, let's make it gleich. Lena. Okay, sorry. Um, so um, uh, sight sight unseen. There is all this controversy about uh, this Belt and Road lending, right? Um, so some have suggested that China is engaging in debt trap diplomacy. So, so for example, fam famous speech by Rex Tillerson, former uh, Secretary of State of the United States, um, arguing that China uses opaque contracts, admire nations in debt, and undercut their sovereignty, right? This is the idea of debt trap diplomacy of China intentionally using uh, it's lending as as a tool of uh, to project power and, and and really undermine the sovereignty of foreign nations. Uh, others, however, emphasize the benefits of China's lending. Uh, much of this lending goes to poor countries and to infrastructure. Uh, and the papers showing that the positive growth effects of this of this lending. Uh, so there's, there's all this other literature emphasizing the the the, the, the pluses of of this activity um, and. Uh, Authors like Breutigam emphasize that, that this, this concern about harsh terms and loss of sovereignty is greatly exaggerated, right? The problem with this debate is really that so far it's very much based on conjecture. Very few of these contracts have, have actually been studied um, and uh, they're just not in the public domain, right? So basically it is, a, is, it is an anecdotal debate without uh, rigorous evidence. And that's exactly what we hope to you know, contribute here um, what we do is we examine 100 original debt contracts uh, of, from China uh, with foreign governments. Uh, and one of our co-authors, uh, Brad Parks of 8 Data, has been uh, identifying and gathering these contracts over a five-year period. So it was a very um, a painstaking effort to actually get hold of these, of these contracts. And we, we use that, that kind of new archive um, of, of contracts to examine uh, what the Chinese do, how they write contracts, and then to compare uh, what China, how China writes contracts to how Western creditors write contracts. So there's no obvious benchmark, right? Sovereign lending is not, there's no international insolvency procedure. There is no uh, um, clear set of rules in the, in the international lending arena, uh, but yet we can compare what China, how China writes contracts to how Western creditor writes contract, write contracts as a benchmark, and that's what we do. And uh, the key takeaways of this exercise is that um, basically to me as a, as a sovereign debt scholar, I, I've been working on these issues for 10 years and it's really fascinating to see what China is doing and how innovative they are, how, how, how they're pushing the frontier in international lending to high risk uh, countries. Um, uh, so, so it's well known that uh, sovereign lending takes place in, a, in, a, in an environment of weakened contractual enforcement. There are all these uh, uh, fundamental papers on it, and China is really um, using legal innovations to deal in to deal with this kind of environment in new ways. Okay, um, and when we do this benchmarking, we find especially uh, we find three dimensions where China deviates, uh, especially uh, visibly, and that is secrecy. So they're particularly opaque. Uh, seniority. So they try to gain advantage vis-a-vis -vis other creditors. Right? They try to. To, to climb the seniority ladder, be treated as a senior creditor, even compared to other um, uh, sovereign uh, lenders. And uh, there's very widespread, a uh, very wide ranging cancellation rights. So China has much uh, uh, discretion in canceling these contracts at will, right? Giving them, uh, of course, a lot of bargaining power. So before I go into the, <coughs> uh, into the details, of these contracts. Let me just show you the sample. Um, these are, we have 100 contracts um, in 24 countries. Uh, that's of course not rep fully representative of the 2000, more than 2000 contracts uh, of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Um, uh, but one of the key insights from this exercise is that there's a large degree of standardization, right? So um, basically the Chinese banks are using four or five types of standardized contracts, and there's not much tailoring to the specific country, to the specific uh, debtor, okay? So lenders use the same design across debtors, meaning that the 100 contracts we have here uh, are representative, are informative for the um, overall Belt and Road lending program that China has been, has been pursuing over the past decade, right? The benchmarking exercise is um, 
done with Cameroon. Okay, so why Cameroon, you might ask? Well, the reason is that opacity is not just a problem for China, but it's a general problem in this field of study, right? And Cameroon is one of the few countries that actually reveals the universe of all its contracts towards bilateral, so government to government lenders, multilateral, think World Bank, or commercial creditors, right? So think Deutsche Bank or, or some sovereign bond um, um, issuance, right? So we can compare uh, the, the, the contracts of, of, of the China rights to the contract of Cameroon uh, in a systematic way. And that, that's, you know, basically the second part of the paper. Um, let me go into the key three key findings. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, details in the paper, but I, I will just focus on, on three main takeaways and then we can maybe discuss uh, more about, you know, in, in, in later after, after the comments have been made. Um, the first really striking insight is that the opacity in this market is by design, okay? So in, 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 in many of these contracts, um, Chinese creditor banks ask the debtor not to reveal any information, okay? So specifically, there's a standard clause, right? So uh, the borrower are, are not allowed to disclose any information, not even the existence of the loan, right? To any third party, right? Not even to its own citizens, the creditors, the IMF, right? So this is, of course, uh, a major challenge for accountability of governments, for account for you know risk. Uh, if 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 these if, if if these contracts, and we've I've, I've said that the amounts lent are very large in some countries, five, ten, fifteen percent of GDP. Right, we're talking about uh, large amounts here, and if these are systematically unreported, that's a major issue, um, right? And it's of course a a problem also for macro surveillance and for intercreditor. Um, uh, comparison and, and fairness issues, right? So, uh, in, in many of these contracts, there is an explicit clause um, uh, that this is this, this contract is to be kept secret at all at all times. Um, and if anything, the secrecy or the opacity has has increased over time, right? So, uh, this is all all the contracts in our database, and from 2015 on, pretty much all the contracts have these very strict confidentiality clauses. The second key uh, insight, and again, fascinating to me as somebody who's worked on the, in this field for, for a long time, is, are these no Paris club clauses, right? So, so since the 1950s, the international system has pretty been, been governed de facto by this set of rules um, that uh, are not, you know, not enshrined in law, but de facto the, the, the Paris club. Uh, so if, if a government like France or the United States uh, forgives debt to a poor country, say Ghana or, or um, uh, Cameroon, uh, then uh, the debt relief that is given by other governments is expected to be extended to other creditors as well, right? So if, if I, as Germany, forgive the debt of Cameroon, I expect private creditors and other sovereigns to also forgive debt in the same amount. So the debt relief, the haircuts should be similar, right? This is the idea of comparable treatment. What China is explicitly saying in these contracts, or the Chinese creditor banks uh, that are state-owned, is explicitly saying is that they do not feel bound by this traditional rule. They they say that they are not, um, they, don't, they don't see these contracts as part of any coordinated debt relief and they don't see um, that this this contract should be treated in comparable terms as any other uh, contracts that the that the uh, that the borrower has outstanding, right? And that's a really you know the the fact that Paris Club per se is even mentioned these contracts is fascinating, right? So it's a unique set. We don't find that in any of the other contracts um, uh, that we examined of Western creditors, and it's also at odds with you know China's commitments to, um, uh, for example, the common framework. Now, what they do ultimately is another matter, but the contracts speak the clear language that they do not see themselves as part of these, of, 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 of a joint uh, effort to uh, improve that, that crisis resolution across creditors. Okay, so think of all these reforms, DSSI, common framework, right? The, the, this is at odds with what the contracts say. Uh, third, uh, or second, part on, on seniority, uh, besides the fact that many of these contracts are secured by, by um, uh, raw materials shipments, right? So we're, we're, we're of course now in a situation where uh, Russia is one of the biggest uh, borrowers from the Belt and Road, right? China is, is, is the biggest uh, creditor, uh, sorry, the biggest borrower um, of, of China's Lend and Belt and Road pr uh, program. However, the contracts are uh, pretty much all backed by oil shipments, right? So even if it's not possible to 
uh, repay these in dollars, they can still be repaid in kind. Okay, but besides that, uh, we emphasize uh, a very fascinating provision, which are these revenue accounts, right? So uh, there's been much focus on collateralization in terms of um, assets, right? So are, are they basically, um, uh, are, is China trying to attach ports and all that? Uh, but what we find is that in fact, uh, there's, there's another type of collateral here, uh, which are these revenue accounts. So in, in about a third of these uh, contracts, uh, the, the, the debtor is supposed to open a, um, a bank account in a uh, bank at the, at, the, at the creditor's choosing, so essentially a Chinese bank account, um, and revenues of the project, a certain share of the revenues, are, are to be deposited in that account. So meaning that, say, you have a power plant in an African country, say 10% of the revenues of that power plant go straight into a Chinese bank account under the control of the creditor. Um, and that is, of course, the ideal form of collateral. It's a cash, cash collateral, and it's something that we didn't realize exists, but we found in these contracts. So uh, there's important security arrangements in many of these contracts, which give, of course, the Chinese a seniority advantage vis-a-vis -vis other creditors. Okay? Um, and the third um, key insight are really these, these cancellation rights, right? So many of the Chinese contracts allow to easily cancel the loan or to declare the loan in default, right? When you declare a loan in default, right, if, if, if an event of default is declared, that means that the entire loan has to be repaid immediately and in full. Plus, the entire project is canceled, right? So the infrastructure or power plant you had been hoping to uh, receive will not materialize, right? So, uh, and and the, the, the reason why we say easily cancel it, basically uh, there's very little that, uh, that, that the, 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 so, so even uh, minor or even policy reforms can lead uh, to a situation where the, the Chinese bank can uh, declare the loan um, in default. Um, uh, or one example is a CDB contract in Ecuador to make this a bit more intuitive, right? So an event of default can occur if the borrower, any government agency or any public entity of the Republic of Ecuador takes any action which would dis disadvantage a PRC, so a Chinese entity, in carrying out its business or operations in the Republic of Ecuador. So that's what we mean by broad, right? This is a very, very broad formulation. So basically, um, under the... Under the um, 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 so from, from the perspective of, of the Chinese uh, creditor, uh, that is, you know, what, what any actions means or any public entity means is, is, is you know, uh, a, a very broad classification, right? In other words, there's a lot of, in other words, there's a lot of secretion uh, of, of China being able to cancel these loans. And of course, you know, ultimately you can ask, uh, what, what about the enforcement of this? And yes, that that's all correct, um, right? So. Uh, these contracts, in a way, are not written uh, to end up in front of a judge. They are political contracts to some degree. And one one example that we make in the paper um, of why these why this language matters and why the contracts uh, and these cross default language uh, these cross default clauses can matter on the cancellation clauses is is, is from Argentina, right? So when uh, President Macri campaigned to for the presidency, he promised to cancel these uh, new dams, expensive. Uh, yeah, dams that the Kirchners had been had been agreeing with China, uh, and when he came to office uh, and won the won the election, uh, he went through on that promise and wanted to cancel the dams, uh, the project, right, which which had just been a, uh, so had, had not yet the works had not yet started, um, wanted to cancel the dams, but then got uh, as Anna calls it an angry angry lawyer letter stating that if these dams are cancelled, if this contract is cancelled, uh, then other contracts of the China Development Bank, particularly the very important Belgrano Cargas railway line, will also be cancelled. Right. So this is this is kind of a threat uh, that um, one cancellation triggers the cancellation of another contract. And ultimately, we don't know the details and what happened, you know, behind the scenes. But what we observe is that ultimately the the, the Kirchner Kaepernick dams were not cancelled. Um, uh, so and, and possibly uh, one one reason. Uh, was was this kind of um, clause and this kind of uh, uh, angry angry lawyer letter. So to conclude, China is a muscular lender to developing countries. It writes innovative contracts uh, to maximize commercial advantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis other creditors. 
um, it finds fascinating ways to, you know, lower the risks of default on its own um, uh, lending, uh, to lower the potential haircuts. And of course, the, the broader uh, policy risks here are kind of a collateral arms race or, or kind of a, a, um, a race to, to tighter contracts of the way China writes them. Um, and of course, there's this uh, possibility um, that the terms may amplify China's influence over the debtor's economic and foreign policies. Uh, finally, let me emphasize that debt transparency is not just a problem for uh, with regard to China, uh, but very much an OECD problem as well. So uh, it's, it's, it's kind of striking that we have to go to Cameroon to find a country that is so transparent, uh, allowing us to do this kind of benchmark exercise. Um, uh, so uh, that transparency is really a uh, looking ahead, a way to, to address these kind of issues head on and allow the population and researchers to evaluate what is really going on in this market. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Okay, so our first discussant is, I believe, also on Zoom. So, Edouard Schall. Yeah. Think. Great, thanks. We'll let you know when, when we see you. Can you see me? We can see you, but we, yes, now we can see you. Brilliant. Let me share my screen. Sorry, I couldn't uh, uh, be physically present. D do you see my slides? Yes, now we do. Okay, great. I would have been delighted to to be here, especially in my hometown, but I had some unmovable meeting. Okay, let me put this on full screen. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so thanks for uh, for uh, uh, for having me to ask to, me to discuss this paper. Uh, it's a very interesting paper, and it's interesting for the same reason I, as I find these panels usually quite interesting, is that they ask questions that, uh, uh, from a different angle than the usual uh, strict uh, economist angle. So here uh, we have, uh, it's an interdisciplinary paper, of course, that we, we as economists, we know uh, uh, quite a bit about sovereign debt, or we have views about sovereign debt. Uh, but I think it's interesting to mix these views with the perspective of lawyers and to see how, uh, you know, some of the incentive uh, issues in repayment, problems of commitments and so on, are going to materialize in some uh, uh, specific uh, clauses that uh, there is in sovereign borrowing. And, and in this, for this set of questions, China is obviously a very uh, uh, telling uh, uh, example. Uh, because, uh, as Christophe explained, it's a very muscular uh, uh, lender. So the paper uh, has a, a fairly uh, clear focus. It's, it's, we're talking here about lending from, state con from government to government, so state-controlled Chinese entities, Chinese banks, uh, uh, to government that makes, you know, one agent being the China, the, 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 the largest uh, single uh, lender uh, in the world. Um, and uh, what makes this contract special uh, relative to perhaps other forms of sovereign borrowing um, is the, the use of uh, specific, tight, and intertwined uh, uh, clauses that essentially serve two purposes. One purpose is, uh, is, is strictly commercial. It's meant to ensure repayments. Uh, and it's doing it by putting more pressure on the on the borrowers that you know traditional country borrowing uh, uh, does, um, and uh, and so it's ensure it does it to ensure repayment or in case of default to ensure uh, seniority. Okay, so there are many devices that are used for that purpose. Uh, Christoph mentioned one of them. Uh, you can have uh, special accounts, including off uh, offshore accounts, where some of the income associated with the finance projects are uh, uh, where it's paid. Uh, extensive confidentiality clauses, no Paris Club clauses, uh, and cross default clauses, which is essentially a, a severe punish punishment threat uh, on the on the borrowing countries. Uh, but some of these clauses. Um, have potentially uh, or, or are mixed with, with clauses that have more of a political uh, 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 impact 
uh, that can be used as a foreign policy tool. Uh, there are these acceleration clauses uh, or these expropriation clauses that are very broadly defined. So if you, uh, uh, in some cases, uh, if, you, if you go against the interest of China, that's, you know, at least in the contract, it's a sufficient reason for triggering uh, acceleration. So it's, uh, it has potentially impli important implications for, uh, for China's geopolitical use of its economic power. I mean, it's, you know, um, maybe that paper can help us uh, understand whether it's, it's a fantasy or, or it's a real, uh, uh, um, uh, it's a serious uh, uh, threat. Um, so one thing to keep in mind when thinking about these issues is that uh, we're talking about a very specific, so there is this, something special about China lending. First is that it's targeted towards some countries. So half of these contracts are to Africa and a quarter of these contracts are to Latin America. So these are the two main uh, destinations for these, uh, for these loans. And these loans finance basically large uh, uh, infrastructure projects, okay, especially in transport and storage, but also uh, energy, water, sanitation, and, and, and so on. Uh, let me skip the, the point about secrecy because Chris, uh, Christoph was quite clear about it. Uh, what you have uh, understood from his talk and what I've, I've just said is that these, the, the contract can be quite complicated and the paper was uh, uh, quite uh, interesting in this respect in describing how complicated the contract was. So for example, when, uh, when in uh, 2010, uh, the China Development Bank uh, lends one million to Equator. It's it's um, uh, it is backed uh, by oil payments. These uh, so oil payments uh, from China uh, to Equator to buy oil from Equator. Uh, these payments go to a special account that China can uh, can uh, can seize in case of. Uh, so this is the initial loan you 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 know you without knowing the paper you will stop here but actually there is simultaneously another contract that is signed for the delivery of goods and there are ways to make sure that uh, uh, this uh, uh, the debt is paid through this delivery of goods so china pays in dollars and and china can seize the dollar uh, uh, in, in case uh, of, of of default so it's basically serving it's uh, the debt is served with with oil it can go much more complicated. So, for example, this is the loan uh, to uh, Sierra Leone for the renovation and expansion of their port. So, initially, you have an offshore, you have, you have a, uh, uh, basically a holding company located in the Virgin Islands, Skyrock, that sets up a subsidiary national port development to renovate the port. And these two are in a concession uh, agreement uh, with the Ministry of Transport. Okay? And they set up the port. Then the loan is taking place. Okay, uh, and with these loans, you have a number of, of 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 clauses that are meant to ensure that repayment will be will be will be made. So, for example, you have this share pledge agreement. So, some of the share of Skyrock can be transferred to a Chinese bank in case uh, in case the borrower misbehaves. Uh, some assets through this mortgage over assets uh, agreement can be transferred to the to the bank, and you have some other clauses. You have a guarantee from the Sierra Leone Ministry of Finance, and you have an additional insurance against commercial and political risk. So there is this whole network of clauses that are meant to to really uh, keep the borrower on a very tight uh, leash. Okay, and then once you've done all that, you can start the work. Okay but before all this legal infrastructure has been put in place. Um, so I have a, a, just a few questions. These are open questions. I understand the data limitations inherent to the, to the approach. Uh, one question is, you know, how, how representative are the two samples that are used in the paper? Uh, by contraction, the, the, the China, uh, uh, you know, the whole point of the paper is that these, these contracts are secretive. Uh, so maybe the contract that you see is actually not uh, all the universe, I mean, not so representative of the universe of Chinese uh, lending contracts. And you would expect that things are even worse there in the hidden part, because precisely because of secrecy, you're less likely to see uh, contracts that are more secret, that, 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 that have more of these non-standard uh, clauses. 
And another question is, is about the, the representativeness of the, of, the, of the benchmark sample, which is about one country, Cameroon. So at that best, it's representative of, of, of Africa. Um, another set of questions, which is related to the sovereign debt crisis literature, uh, why is China able to do that and not the others? Why, are there, you know, why aren't uh, other countries uh, uh, replicating by also lending at tighter conditions that they have in the past because China is doing it in a worthwhile fashion, it seems. So why, why China and not the others? Uh, why aren't the others replicating with seniority clauses? Because it's a game between the lenders. Okay? And, and more generally, you know, um, I'm wondering how to, to relate more tightly those clauses to the, to the uh, sovereign debt and default literature, which stresses particular aspects of limited commitment, moral hazards of the on the part of the debtor, and presumably those clauses are meant to, to, to limit that. And, and I will, I will uh, uh, stop here. Thanks very much. So let me unshare. Okay, so next up is Nicola. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'm Nicola Limodio from Bocconi University. As the only present person in this panel, I will take all the fury of your questions or anything that could be. I hope to be the present person to give you the energy and actually some very interesting things about this paper. So let me tell you, this is a thought-provoking and very well-written paper. Uh, it's interdisciplinary. It's a nice team of, uh, of authors that put together different expertise, and you feel it by reading the paper. So they managed to put together something uh, thoughtful and well-assembled. Um, they did very precious and careful data work. They basically went contract by contract, classifying different characteristics of loans, and they created a data set that allows us to actually look at how China lends. Uh, it has an audience in trade, it has an audience in finance, it has an audience in development. I mean, it's a paper that many people are going to read and many people are going to cite. So I think uh, it's a great idea to have it here. And it's really encyclopedic. I learned a lot of things that I didn't know on sovereign lendings. And I hope to be able to uh, convey some of these new things I learned through this paper. So let me thank you know, the editors of Economic Policy for inviting me to discuss this paper. Uh, now, my discussion is going to be kind of uh, simple. I'm going to give a very brief summary of the paper, the discussant and the presenter did a very good job. Uh, what I'm going to do first is to think about the interpretation of their findings. So how China lands. I'm trying to give you an economic interpretation of how China lands, at least to try to see it through the lenses of economic theory. That's a part in the paper that is actually not really there. So the paper has a descriptive view, which is perfect. But you know, the authors could do more in uh, bringing back this wealth of result and knowledge that they are creating and thinking about this from the perspective of an economist. And then I'm going to go through some uh, nitty gritty, uh, but that's uh, relatively self-contained comment. So why do we care about Chinese lending? I think the others did a good job in telling you this. Uh, China is the largest global lender. Uh, to put things in magnitudes, we are talking about 1.5 trillion USD, 5% of global GDP. That's a, is that a lot? Is that little? Well, it's actually more than the World Bank, the IMF, and all official development assistance that OECD countries give combined. So China nowadays gives more than anybody else put together. The World Bank has 15,000 employees, 20,000 consultants, and it's a tiny fraction of what China is actually giving out. Fun fact, China is also the largest borrower from the World Bank. So you know, there is a lot of action going on with money coming in and out. Now, uh, China had a phenomenal impact on credit markets and on development, whatever you know, many um, uh, kind of, you know, discussions were about money flowing from high income to low income. What we observe is peanuts compared to what is happening right now. So we need to study this. It's actually a good idea to have papers on this. And uh, we don't know very much about the terms and the effects of China. 
And the fact that we don't know what happens creates an extremely radicalized debate with people saying, oh, you know, it's Chinese money, it's a bomb for prosperity, everything is going to change, Africa is going to become China's China, something like that. And then you get the opposite views with, uh, oh, Africa will not put up with a colonialist China and slavery and so on and so forth. So you have these very radicalized views, and you know, you can be anywhere in between this. What we lack to go beyond radicalization is looking at data. And that's what the authors are doing. And I do know something about this because I've done some research on this as well. Uh, we did a paper on the impact of Chinese FDI in Africa, and we use some export taxes in China. We see that when these export taxes in China change, Chinese redirect some investment abroad, and the results are not really radical, they are complex. You see that Chinese FDI arrives and the local market of competitors is destroyed. There is a bit of benefits to connected firms. The effects on GDP spot on are zero, but maybe positive in the long run. So you see, it's, there is no easy kind of, you know, a silver line of interpreting the effect of China out there. And that's what the authors find. And that's what I'm going to tell you here as well. So the research question of this paper is, what are the terms of Chinese loans to sovereign governments? How does it fare in the solidarity slavery kind of, you know, uh, interval? Now, uh, this paper is a descriptive paper. It's very careful, it's very valuable, it takes a lot of work, multiple checks, and the authors describe how different teams look at data, cross-validate the results. I mean, I think, you know, we need more of this in economics, and so it's great that th this type of papers are on these panels and are in the discussion. Sometimes, you know, in the search for identification, on which I am all in, we lose track with big, uh, with big points. And this is one of those. So two impactful contributions. First, uh, they build a data set with 100 contracts out of a population of presumably 2,000. Um, they track financial variables, what's the principle of the loan, what the interest set, the currency, the collateral, and the non-financials. What's the priority of this loan relative to the stock of others? So in case of default, would China be paid before Paris club members? Uh, seniority, how senior is that? Anyway, repayment clauses that were discussed also by the speaker. Now, um, the second point is comparing Chinese contracts to the others. And they use information from other contracts. What is interesting, and I think it wasn't stressed enough by the speaker, is that when we think about standards in international sovereign lending, there are no standards. So we don't know. I mean, Chinese contracts are secret, but we don't know when Italy is giving a loan to Eritrea rather than another country what the contract is. So it's hard, like, you know, we know that the Chinese contracts are explicit about secrecy, but it's not that we know much else about the others. The way they go around this is by using the government of Cameroon which, you know, some f official in the government said, let's put everything online for full transparency. The authors scraped the data smartly and put it in an online repository. And then the government of Cameroon said, oopsie, everything, they shut down the website. But, you know, nothing cancels on internet. And so we can, they can study that. All the data is out there. Now, what are the key findings? First of all, who gives? I would like to invite us to break the monolith of China. It's not that China is a single entity with one thought and one agent fully deciding. There are a bunch of organizations that belong to different degrees to the Chinese government that are independent to dif different degrees from the Chinese government. And so we learned that two are the big players, the Export-Import Bank, Exim, and uh, China Development Bank. Now. Uh, if you want to listen to one liner of this paper and then check your emails, Chinese loans are stricter, but not so much. I think that's how I would describe the paper in one one liner. If we want to be a bit more careful, as we do want to be, Chinese loans are structured to be more. S okay. Oopsie. Sorry. I don't know what I did. Ah, I took the picture. That was a nice one. Okay. See, more secrecy, there are confidentiality clauses. We already discussed that. Second, uh, they are more cautious. 
So there are cash collateral constraints. They don't allow restructuring. They include cross default, which means that if I am defaulting on Kevin's loan, Moritz, there is a Chinese bank, will consider my loan as a default and will recall the money. This cross default clauses have different impacts. One is to make the cost of default very high, even higher than the financial cost of the default. So basically pricing in the reputational effect of a defaulter. But uh, what I think is more interesting is that these contracts contract in China's national interest in an explicit manner. Uh, the PRC entity, or there are diplomacy clauses or policy clauses, say that if you are a government that has received a loan from China Development Bank, Exim Bank, or so on and so forth, if you do a policy that is opposed by the Chinese government or a Chinese agency or anyone that somehow belongs to People's Republic of China, you are liable to be considered defaulted. So in a sense, they are trying to put pressure on countries. One interpretation is they're trying to put pressure on countries to behave according to what we could call the Beijing consensus. Of course, enforcement and implementation, we don't really know. So there are all these contracts. They have some beautiful characteristics. Uh, China can trigger a default, can trigger a repayment, can stop giving money. But we don't really know whether that happens. In fact, the enforcement may even be counterfactual. So we don't know to what extent these terms affect behavior. Now, uh, interpreting these results, uh, this evidence can help us understand the economics of Chinese lending and understanding how different agencies may be behaving I, in particular, what theoretical framework fits these results? How China lends through the lenses of economics? I try to think of a couple of models of banking that could kind of be useful here. And would be, I, think, I thought of four, but maybe you know, we can think of more. One is banking as an input for political conquest, for alliance. Banking as entry in the international credit market by China or banking for political influence, or for long-term investment. And in a sense, uh, if you think of a model of banking for political conquest, this is a picture that is not very clear. There, are, there is a dragon with two heads. Uh, there is Exim Bank and China Development Bank. And here there are you know, some people fighting. If you are anti-China, these are the people of the country that gets the loan. If you're pro-China, this will be poverty and you know, anything against prosperity and solidarity. OK. Now, uh, these contracts don't violate international standards. And indeed, there, were, uh, sim there are similar ones. These contracts are sophisticated. I mean, if you take, I looked at you know, some of the old literature on USSR lending or Cuba's lending, and they would explicitly embed political clauses. These are not here. There is no explicit military defense or military action that's implied in the contract. So this model doesn't really you know, seem to be, uh, at least is not consistent with you know, the structure, the terms of the loans. Uh, a model of entry in credit markets, you can think you know, of knocking on markets door, where basically you know, there is the, the heaven of international do dollar lending, and China wants to enter into this paradise of you know, dollar lending, creating an RMB facility in many countries. This could be plausible. Uh, in fact, China is out of the consensus. I, I, I work between finance and development. I've been in Africa. And many times you have lenders that are the World Bank, EBRD, EIB, Asian Development Bank, and they have a consensus. They join forces. They are together. There is coordination. Uh, a project manager from the World Bank can, get, can create a syndicate with the BRD with some additional money. This does not happen to Chinese. So they are out of this you know, uh, OECD consensus, if we want to say. And so you can think that the lack of coordination of China with other lenders can induce you know, a lower risk tolerance that's reflected in these terms of the contract. But really, the Chinese contracts, as the authors describe, are not some new contracts that are very different from the others. They are standard contracts, but tougher. 
standard contracts with clauses that are pushed to the limit of risk aversion, in a sense. So the models that seem to fit what the authors have in mind, and I would invite them to think a bit about this, is one, a model of banking under political influence, and you know, in which banks are actively managed. So they do take decisions, uh, CBD, Exim, and the others. They have assets. They, have some li they collect liabilities. They have to give loans and other products. And well, uh, they reference to China's national interest because they have to. They have a, this induces them to have some political economy friction or a constraint that basically, you know, it's either in the parameter of risk aversion or it's a constraint on their shareholder assets that cannot default. And this could be one, maybe to safeguard the independence of the institution. So I want to keep CBD to be independent from Beijing to some extent, and then I want to be extra safe. The second could be the career concerns of the agents, which is Today, I'm the president of China's Development Bank. Tomorrow, I may be the Ministry of Finance. The day after, I could be in the Politburo. I don't want to screw up. Thank you. I don't want to, uh, I guess screw up is not the exact words. I don't want to fail. And so I make the contracts, particularly, um, particularly uh, I make the contracts that reflect my risk aversion. The second could be a model of of banking for long-term investment. And that's a completely different way to think um, China's lending. China doesn't really care about the loans per se. Here, banks are passively responding to investment opportunities. Uh, China has a lot of investment in Ethiopia. They built, uh, uh, you know, kind of a uh, elevated railway system, which was designed, financed, and built by Chinese companies in three years, 100 kilometers. Now, finance responded to a necessity for long-term investment. And so in a sense, here, banks are not so interesting. Uh, it's the real investment opportunities that are driving banking, and that are reflected through all these cash collateral constraints. This may also make sense, has some predictions that are in line with this model, but the mechanism is different. There is an extreme concavity, almost Leontief, between the investment opportunity, the investment product, and the financial that comes with it. And of course, the authors cannot really distinguish between these two, and I wouldn't ask them to do that. But just you know, to think about which models could fit the interesting descriptives that they have. And so I would, in, yeah, I don't want to talk. The introduction and the conclusion can be written. Introduction should be shorter, five pages, simple, clear, to the point. And the conclusion should go, you know, uh, this is a positive paper, a paper with positive statements about contracts. I would avoid normative statements like, you know, public debt should be public or we need more transparency or discuss corruption. I mean, this is not in the paper. And I don't think that's where the analysis is going. So I think the paper would be a lot sharper, impactful by being simple and clear. And so this is a good paper. It describes the term and condition of Chinese lending to foreign governments. We don't know much about this. Uh, we learned that Chinese contracts are commercially savvy, secretive, cautious, and national interest, but not so, so different from the ones of other countries. And so Chinese lending through the theories, Chinese lending through the lenses of theory, domestic policies, foreign opportunities, both, maybe something else. I mean, that would be you know, the input that I hope to make with this discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. OK, uh, we'll have questions before. Uh, I'll start asking, is there anybody on Zoom whom I can't see who has a question before we begin around the table? No? OK, I'll begin with Richard then. Richard, tell us who you are. Richard Portis. Um, Co-founder of Economic Policy. Very pleased to be back in a panel meeting after a couple of years of absence. Uh, and I've got three quick comments. One, uh, I used to work a lot on sovereign debt. Don't do so anymore. But uh, when I did, we are in the home of the Paris Club. The Paris Club was really important. Comparable treatment was especially important. And the Chinese opting out of this is very destructive. I, maybe I misunderstood Nicola, but uh, I, it's very destructive of the international order in these matters. 
uh, and I think that's um, uh, I think that's important. A second comment: uh, those of you, what I am working on right now, as it happens, is crypto and DeFi, uh, and in the DeFi literature, there's a lot about smart contracts. Well, sorry, no contract, no smart contract could be written that would uh, bring in all the qualifications, all the clauses, et cetera, uh, in these Chinese contracts. Uh, so, um, you know, we have a body of, of economic literature on, uh, on contracts and contract law and, and incomplete contracts. These contracts get pretty close to being complete, but of course they're not. Um, they still allow for adjudication um, and uh, uh, interpretation by the Chinese. Um, the third point uh, goes to the author specifically, uh, and it arises out of a paper that just crossed my screen this morning uh, from the IMF, uh, which is a meta study of 15 um, studies of the effects of Chinese lending to I don't know how many countries, but lots, okay? Uh, and the bottom line of this paper is that uh, the economic effects of the Chinese lending have on net been positive. Now, I wonder whether the authors are thinking of trying to extend this wonderful database that they already have uh, and the analysis that they already have to look at the consequences of Chinese lending uh, and try to go beyond this very substantial already uh, existing literature. Thank you. Thanks very much. Did I see a uh, uh, hand yourself? Yeah. I, tell I, us who you are again. Yeah. Uh, sorry, David Newmark. I, I was a little confused by, I think, the, what the author was saying and Nicola was saying, so I'll just ask the question and maybe it can be clarified later. Um, uh, Nicola said, I think, you know, you sort of, they're a little tougher, but, you know, they're just a little tougher. But I was, I was very struck by the sort of political interest part of this. And I think the only analogy you drew, I could be wrong, was to Cuban and Soviet contracts, which I think are not the relevant contracts now. I mean, I was just sitting, I, it, looked, it looked very nefarious to me. I mean, suppose Taiwan, you know, Taiwan gets invaded by China and a country wants to impose sanctions on China. China default, you know, calls in all these loans and as far as I understand, takes over, in many cases, uh, resources as a consequence of that. Am I, am, I, am I reading that wrong? Is that as, and is that really similar to what happens in, you know, Paris Club lending, which I think was the, the suggestion that was, uh, you know, only modestly different. Thank you very much. Okay, go, go ahead. To jump on these, uh, do you, uh, I don't know if it's a question to Nicola or to the authors or both. So are you aware of the possibility of tracking uh, the votes in international organizations for China in a sort of different, uh, you know, uh, uh, when, when there, are, there is more lending coming in, are the votes in international organization more favorable to China from the countries that get more? So that's, that would be very prima facie, superficial evidence that could help us to go to better understand uh, what is the, because I think that, that there are two, two, two political issues. One is the internal political issues, which is the one that Nicola was pointing out, which is fine. So very related to the career concerns of the officers. The other one is the, you know, is the strategic landing uh, to, uh, to for, for the politic, for the international politics. And so and this second thing could be quite, uh, quite interesting to look at. So I think that the, the, if the data are easy to get. Moritz. Thank you, I'm Moritz Schulerick. Um, two questions, I mean, great, great, great paper and great discussions, of course, lots of, lots of data work and super interesting. So first point, and it relates to what Roberto just said, is um, one could be, one could look at international organization votes, but you could also just look at trade, no? Is this, what is China getting from this? What is, what is the effect of this? Why are they doing this? And uh, so this sort of Scree Bono question is, is, is quite, is quite there, especially if we have a suspicion that this is sort of politically motivated. It's not 100% clear to me what it is they're getting, no? So maybe, you know, maybe some, some trade uh, effects that you could measure. Um, the second question, I mean, also, also connects to, to uh, what, what, what Richard has said before. Where is, where is China really um, 
different? What is, what is I mean, the, 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 the enforcement problem in sovereign debt is still there. China has the same problem. It can't just go in and take the oil. So what is really different about what China does? I, I, I think you, you have this in the paper, but I would be interested like, also for the discussion and like getting this framing right to, maybe you can tease this out a little bit more where China really overcomes, um, I mean, either overcomes sovereign debt market problems or is, is does really something that is that is unheard of in, 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 in other lending. Thanks, Vincent. Okay. Yep, uh, Vincent Serica, I thought this was fascinating. Um, a question, uh, I wonder if the, um, these clauses are reflected in uh, the rates, in lower rates that these countries pay, whether this is a matter of contract differentiation that potentially these countries are happy to sign up to or whether it's, it's more a matter of uh, China flexing its muscle as a large player. Hi, I'm Claire Lim. Um, I'm a lawyer at Gangsala, but I, ha but I have very little knowledge of the uh, international contract. So I wanted to ask questions about institutional details that are very much along with um, the comments from other uh, participants. So um, my primary comment is exactly which part of this uh, relative abuser abusive terms of contract are enforceable uh, through what procedures and in what kind of terms are not enforceable. And thinking of this question, I could think of um, two very different contexts of contracts um, that are primarily between private citizens that tend to be very abusive. So one very well-known context of uh, abusive contract is between, say, sexual harassment victims and sexual harassment perpetrators. And it is well known that um, many of very standard uh, non-disclosure or secrecy clauses are not enforceable in the courts. And another very well-known context of very abusive terms is between uh, human tra trafficking organizations and prostitutes. And a lot of contracts in those, contract, uh, those contexts are also not enforceable in, in the judicial system as well. So um, I would like to know more about um, how much like, legal scholars actually know about what is re precisely which portion is, is uh, enforceable, pre uh, what kind of practices that are not enforceable in this kind of context. And this is also a question to the discussants as well. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, Richard has a two-hander, okay. Go Quick for question it. for the authors. Um, do you have data or information on what court adjudicates um, contractual disputes uh, in these contracts? Yeah, thank you. Okay, go ahead, and your name as well? M Moritz Kuhn. Um, I just have a clarification question. So. Like if they are lending to a government and then there is a confi confidentiality clause, like it, it, it's a little bit hard for me to imagine that you lend to a government and say we want interest back on this loan, but you must not tell like anybody about this loan. I, I don't don't see how that could could work. Thanks very much. Any other questions? I had a sort of question. I mean. Um, these these kind of collateral kind of clauses and so on are they all suggesting that that the, the the Chinese are particularly reluctant to see their debts defaulted on or more reluctant than other countries? I mean, nobody wants to be defaulted on, but are they particularly worried about this? Do you get the sense? Because if so, that would be kind of interesting information about them going forward in the wicked world in which we live. Can I? I hit my hand raised. Maybe I should have actually spoken before. And this is Giacomo, the Jordi. Um Can you hear me? Well, I, I'm missing the demand side of the story, which I think relates to some of the questions that were asked. Uh, you know, contractual terms are somewhat terms that are defined by typically multi-agents, uh, demand that the supply side exists. So there must be demand for loans that then is, are supplied by Chinese institutions. And I sort of, I, I missed that part. Maybe I just missed it myself. We are seeing is the equilibrium outcome. So, so you know, we need to know the other side. <laughs> there must be a reason why you know countries are borrowing under these terms. Yeah, so I would like to know more about that. I mean, is there anything that we can know there? I assume there's a literature about that. Like, do people with human rights problems are they more likely to go for the, these loans? Or I presume there's a literature about this. Um, any other questions? Going once, going twice, okay. Uh, so Christoph, uh, 
uh, respond. Uh, you have right, so five so or six minutes, so yeah. Okay, wonderful. So thanks a lot uh, first to the discussant, Edouard and Nicolas. Um, uh, excellent discussions. Uh, let me just, so that I don't miss anybody, walk walk back, like starting from the last question, then walk back to the to the discussant. Um, demand side, uh, so why would anybody borrow under these terms? Well, these are package deals, right? You get a new power plant. These are capital scarce countries, uh, and you get infrastructure you badly need. And you get that under a set of standard, you know, basically procedures that the Chinese roll out, right? So as, as we said, this is not tailored to a specific debtor. It's basically you want the power plant, here's the deal. You sign or you don't, right? That, that's kind of like how it works. And the terms of these loans in terms of interest rates, they're still more fit that they're expensive than the World Bank loans, which are like one to one or two percent interest rates. Here you pay four, five or for something, but it's still not the sovereign bond uh, premium of seven, eight percent, right? So these are also attractive if you are capital scarce compared to, uh, say, going on the international bond market. Okay, so there is the basic demand for uh, for capital. There's a basic demand for infrastructure. And if you want uh, to go down the Chinese route, then that's the deal you get. That's the contract you get. It's not tailored. It's just what they write to all of them, right? So that's kind of, I think, the, uh, the demand side issue. Um, um, Moritz Kuhn, uh, well, I mean, we, we found in another paper that, in fact, many of these bonds are not uh, in the, for example, World Bank or IMF statistics, many of these loans, right? So, so basically, you say you can't imagine, well, you know, that's what happens, right? The World Bank in 2017 wasn't aware of about 50% of these loans, right? So we have all been working with that statistics that were wrong. Right, so so it is imaginable, and it it, it it happens, right? So these are these are contracts that were not reported. The World Bank has now caught up, so they, they have filled many of the reporting gaps. But uh, until like 2018, 19, basically um, a big chunk of this was simply not known. Let alone, you know, in Sierra Leone, that the population would know much about it, right? Um, not even the international organizations with all their enforcement powers. These are countries with continuous IMF programs where you can actually have leverage. Uh, and yet you don't know much about them, so that structure. Uh, what court? Uh, so this is basically, many of these are Chinese uh, law. Uh, there's some, some of them have uh, international court, uh, international um, uh, arbitration, so, so international chamber of commerce uh, arbitration, but essentially it's, it's, it's basically going to a, to a Chinese judge, right? Uh, uh, enforcement, and there we go to the question of, of also of, of Moritz. Uh, so how, how is this actually enforced, right? Well, it's, 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 we, we can't say anything about it. Uh, we just look at the contracts here. Uh, the, the, what happens in default is even more opaque than the lending or the contract. So it's very hard to say what happens, but what we can say just from a few anecdotes is that um, the language seems to matter. The Argentine example that I gave is an example, uh, but it also, uh, uh, in terms of like, why does it, why, why does all of this matter anyway? It's just like, why would China bother to write all these detailed, beautiful clauses? Well, the same question can be asked to a sovereign bond uh, lawyer or a or Commerzbank or uh, Credit Agricole that borrow uh, that lends to African countries. Why would you Why would you even bother to write all these detailed contracts? Well, eventually, um, one re one answer is that these are also political contracts. They have a signaling uh, value, and in fact, as you can say. Uh, when a new government comes in, the Chinese can say, well, you signed, your previous government signed that contract, we made this agreement with you, and now you better stick with it, otherwise you are basically uh, infringing uh, the contract with us. And uh, it has these consequences in a couple of uh, cases that we could show, but of course this paper is not strong on the effect side. This also relates to like, what, what is the consequences of all of this, right? But it, it nevertheless sheds light for the very first time on how these contracts actually look like. And then the next step, of course, this raises hundreds of questions and it raises the question, what are, why would you do that? And why, what are the effects? But uh, we can show that some of these concerns that, that you know, these contracts might be used for leverage uh, by, by Chinese banks um, are not completely unfounded, right? We are very careful in the paper, we're very cautious but, you know, you show this to a couple of lawyers, to veteran lawyers who have been in sovereign debt for 20 years, 30, 40 years, they, they, this, this is jaw-dropping stuff, right? They have never seen these kind of cancellation contracts. 
they have never seen you know basically if you do if any entity does anything against the interest of china you know basically this this alone can be called in default this is not something that is usual so we are cautious but it should be you know we should want to keep in mind just how uh, striking this is and i agree fully agree with richard uh, just killing the paris club uh comparative treatment like that right that 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 per se is is, is fascinating and striking um so again tomorrow chulari question uh co collateral no paris cl so 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 what, why is it different well for example they have these cash collateral accounts we know because we looked into these contracts we know that basically there is a there, there are these projects and they have cash collateral in china now that is very easy to seize as eduard was saying right it's easy to 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 attach that money and that is a major difference that's not what other uh, sovereign lenders do right uh, the paris stop stuff the cancellation so etc so so it matters and the, the argentine example again showed that it can have real consequences right so yes the enforcement problem is still there but this is a powerful political uh, tool that's one one takeaway i think uh which also relates to you know some of what nicola was saying uh so i i kind of disagree with this idea these are just a little tougher we, i mean we have five co-authors we had all these you know what the tone of the paper how you write it is you know ultimately a compromise but it's it you know it's a very cautious way we write this down right it, this is this is it's actually quite striking how different these contracts really in the end of the day are granted there are no standards but you know for 60 70 years we've been writing contracts in certain ways uh, we know that not just from Karun but many other studies and now China is doing something very different and, and pushing the frontier and I think that's you know just important to to realize so it's not just a little so the steroids is really you know maybe the more more the cooler way to put it um on the effects I mean I don't know how how far we can move from the safe ground that the evidence in this paper gives us I mean uh, the, we have other China work where we actually have all the loans. It's much more of a universe of contract where you could do a more rigorous assessment. You know, what's the effect of this on lending? In fact, there are other papers that already try to do that. Um, uh, the the um, uh, that's probably not the strength of this paper. It's really looking into under the hood of this lending universe of this new phenomenon is is really what I think the paper is strong as that. Um, and then. Um, how representative is this, Edouard raised? Uh, well, it's not just Cameroon, right? We also compare to the standard contract of banked international, right? The LMA template, the uh, uh, Loan Market Association template. It's a standard contract term uh, uh, template that all these banks use. And China follows that template, but then has these very striking deviations from the template. So in that sense, uh, it, it, it's not the representativeness of Cameroon, but it's really like, how does it deviate from international banking norms, right? And the China thing, I, I, I emphasize that there is this high degree of standardization. So this is informative for the broader uh, universe of, of loans, of contracts. Um, now, I fully agree with both Eduard and Nicola that, you know, there could be more on theory, there could be more on what does this all mean for us as economists, uh, how does it speak to the classic, you know, Bulo Rogoff and Eaton and Gerzovitz and enforcement issues and banking issues? The problem is there, you know, we've thought long about it. We even had a couple of pages on this, but decided to drop it ultimately because there's a risk of overburdening the paper. There's already a lot on it now, and doing that right is not very, is not straightforward. I mean, I've been discussing, you know, several hours with a theory co-author of mine on just what's the benefit of secrecy, right? It's not, it's, you know, not even obvious. Uh, whether we should have, and that there I, I, I grant, you know, fair point of Nicola, you know, avoid these normative statements at the end, that's really well taken, uh, because it's not clear whether we want to be more transparent or not, right? Who, who benefits from the secrecy? It's not straightforward. So, so alone, that, that, that point alone, right, that's one part of like 24 findings, that point alone, point alone requires a lot of thinking of how it relates to sovereign, sovereign debt theory. Um, it was not at all obvious uh, to somebody who has been working on this for many years. Uh, and generally, it's very hard, you know, to to just uh, to tell a cohesive and a story that is not loose in terms of like what is the best um, model, uh, what is the best, you know, framework in which we want to interpret these contracts. I think it raises many, many questions. But I agree 
the, the strength is, of course, not to say, like, this is a paper that also explains all of it and tells and frames all of it into the theory. I think, you know, it's more of a, you know, like like maybe in the 1970s when we started to think about sovereign bonds again, right? It's more, I see the paper more like that. This is a new type of lending. We haven't fully understood it, and I think we need, we can't do it all in one paper, right? So it's more about raising questions and showing that this is actually, there's actually a lot going on in these contracts that we still have to understand. Um, and then giving all these answers on effects and and uh, you know what 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 it all means for for uh, economics or a sovereign debt theory. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thanks a million. Well done. Okay, so we have it was a break. Fascinating there. comments. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, so you have a we have a break now until five fifteen when we have Nicola uh, speaking. So I presume since that's been streamed and so on, it'd be good to start that promptly since people all over the world will be zooming in, hopefully. Okay, 